What's going on guys, this is Rob. Uh, if you guys enjoy my content, make sure you hit the subscribe button and make sure you hit that little bell so you never miss out on my sexy voice. Oh my God. Okay, so I'm back from C2E2. Fun story. You guys are gonna get a kick out of this. Fun story. So writer Nick Spencer, the guy who's writing Captain America, Steve Rogers, and Secret Empire, uh, and Captain America, Sam Wilson, and a handful of other stories, he had like a one hour signing at the Marvel booth at C2E2. And so I'm sitting in line and I'm just like, oh my God, this is gonna be so cool to finally meet Nick Spencer and to say, hey, look, man, I love what you're doing with Steve Rogers. I think him being a Hydra agent is one of the coolest things, you know, that's, that's come out of Marvel Comics for quite some time. I get up there and like, he, he signs a thing for a guy he's like, cool, man. Thanks for coming. And he looks up. He's like, you're the Comics Explained guy. And I was like, you're Nick Spencer. <laughs> It was so cool because he knew who I was. And I mean, he didn't know my name or anything. He just knew me as a Comics Explained guy, but that's good enough for me. And I was like, wow, Nick Spencer knows who I am. It was mind blowing. I got a picture with Jonathan Hickman. Those of you guys who have been following my channel long enough, you guys know Hickman is like my, like, like, man, like I'm, man, I'm fanboy out for Jonathan Hickman. I'm just like, God, I love your writing. Uh, he's one of the coolest guys ever. Um, I got to meet Jason Aaron. And then of course I got to meet all you guys on the Rob Corps. And this is kind of the crazy thing. As a YouTuber, whenever I upload videos, seeing your comments is one thing and of course i look at like the views that videos get and i realize well each one of those is a person but meeting you in person changes everything because it's like this person loves my videos and this person watches them and it's just it, it, it helps to keep me grounded i think it helps to remind me that tangible people out there that i can meet at conventions love the content that i upload and so it's just it's really cool to be able to meet and and talk to you guys and uh yes the rob core will be getting a lantern ring that story is being fleshed out in the ultimate weekly recap those of you guys who don't know myself benny a comic historian uh Caitlin and that sea monster and Dylan in the background. We all work together to upload that series and get it to you guys. We have a current story arc going on where I killed Benny and uh, I will be getting a yellow lantern ring and then eventually the Rob Core ring. So <laughs> a little bit of a spoiler there, but uh, but we pick up with Secret Empire number zero. Man, now let me tell you something. Man, I was dude, I was going over this story, <laughs> man. Man, let me tell you something, man. I had to stop halfway through and catch my breath because I was just like, oh my god, it's so good. Now there are a couple things with regards to what's going on in secret empire we do have to play a little bit of catch up and we're gonna do that in videos i want to get this out there because i just love it so much and i was so excited uh but i'm gonna create a playlist probably here in the next week or so and it's just gonna be the secret empire playlist so it'll have everything you need to know in chronological order so we're gonna go back and we're gonna cover avengers standoff we're gonna go back and we're gonna cover like thunderbolts and stuff like that i mean this it's their videos that a lot of people probably won't care about because they're so old but i want to have them there just for the sake of continuity and so because of that uh, it'll give people who are getting into secret empire a good starting place in order to, to see everything and know how we got to this point. But of course, for those of you guys who are new, Secret Empire is basically Marvel's big summer event that's supposed to set everything back to rights. It's supposed to give us back a lot of the characters that we knew and loved and things like that. And Marvel Legacy uh, looks like it's shaping up to be Marvel's version of DC Rebirth. So it looks like it's gonna be kind of cool in terms of, of how it's all uh, how it's all playing out. But as this opens up, uh, myself and Benny and o over at Comic Story and actually had a debate about things. Uh, this segment really covers Steve Rogers getting back in contact again with Kraken. Now, of course, Kraken, as we know, him is basically kind of like the you know one of the the top guys within the hydra leadership and that's really the way hydra is right like you've got you know baron von strucker who originally broke off from the nazis thought the nazis were short they were short-sighted they were like look hydra can be so much more because the nazis were like well we know we're just going to take over europe and then get rid of anybody who's not what we consider to be you know the perfect german hydra was like we don't need to kill people we can conquer the world through other means so hydra entered itself into governments and into companies and the whole nine yards uh they basically you know influenced themselves all throughout the world and and even influence the things that shield were doing they were basically controlling shield in a lot of different ways and so because of that where there were attempts by like the red skull really right now in the events leading up to secret empire and all new all different marvel while there were attempts by a few individuals here and there to basically move hydra back in the direction of being like the nazis uh in the end hydra is not the nazis and so because of that a uh, hydra stance has always been world domination not executing people because they're not the perfect german that was the nonsensical nazi stuff very short-sighted very small time stuff so because of that what we end up doing here is we basically have this weird scenario unfolding and steve rogers or at least the you know what's what seems to t seems to take place here is he's sort of put in like this pool and what happens is he's basically told hey look your memories will be modified things will be changed someone somewhere along the line is going to undo everything and so the indication seems to be here that steve rogers was a hydra agent right up until world war ii he was basically working as a hydra agent until world war ii then he underwent and you know underwent this whole experience with a pool that kind of thing and his memories were modified so that he was basically the Captain America that we knew, that we know right now, the one that you think of when you think of Captain America. What ended up happening, at least the indication here seems to be, that during the events
sense of Avengers standoff when his history was modified by the Cosmic Cube, that instead of actually changing his history, it set his history back to the way it was supposed to be. And so again, it's really kind of a cool situation here because what it's doing is it's toying with the notion that the Captain America you think of, the guy who's, you know, fights on behalf of like freedom and things like that, the good Captain America, that that was basically his mind being modified. His memories were altered. Uh, the bad Captain America, the Hydra Captain America, was the true Steve Rogers. It was just hidden under the surface in terms of memories that were replacing it. So that's something that I imagine will be very divisive among Captain America fans. But to me, that's why it goes into some great storytelling because then it begs the question, which one's which? Is this whole thing a ruse? Is it basically Hydra saying, hey, look, Captain America's legacy is growing beyond the point that we can control it. So we're going to tell him, you know, well, here's your real history. We're going to tell him, here's what's really going on. We're effectively going to dupe him, but he is inherently a good guy. There are a lot of things that are going on here that are really kind of asking the question, is he genuinely good or is he genuinely bad? Uh, but the fact remains here that this kind of jumps back up to the modern day, because remember right now, Captain America is basically the director of S.H.I.E.L.D. That's something that we saw for, you know, during the events of the Oath, uh, following the trial of Maria Hill. Again, we've paid very close attention to the run of Captain America, Steve Rogers, and we have all that stuff covered so far. Uh, but with him being the director of S.H.I.E.L.D., the funny thing about this is people still look at him as Captain America, Steve Rogers. They look at him as the good guy. They still don't know he's a Hydra agent, but somebody here will actually find that out. And that's one of, it's one of the coolest reactions. But what this also does is it basically brings a lot of these things to bear. The fact that Baron Zemo has been traveling around, rallying up all these different supervillains to attack the various superheroes. At the same time, we had talked about how within the Marvel landscape that Steve Rogers had basically stolen a queen from the Chitauri and then brought it to Earth so that the Chitauri army would constantly launch invasion attacks against Earth, trying to, you know, take their queen back. And Steve Rogers used this as a means to instigate the creation of a shield around the planet Earth that would keep it protected. Now, of course, that shield was the brainchild of Carol Danvers and Maria Hill, and they were allowed to basically continue the, the creation of this shield. But again, all this really seems to coincide where I guess really come to a head in the zero issue when it's just this massive series of events all unfolding at the same time. Now, Benny asked a really good question. He was like, why is it that every time there's like a major event, it always starts with a major battle? Well, in truth, this is really just kind of designed to grab our attention and bring us in. That's the greatest thing about, about what Nick Spencer does, because so far in his writing, he doesn't do a whole lot of like huge grandiose battles, right? Like it's been all character development, 100% character development. Now, there's been little battles here and there and things like that, but on the whole, it's largely been almost entirely character development and it works out pretty well. The issue with this is that again, the shield as it exists, as it's supposed to be protecting the planet Earth is malfunctioning. And so we basically have Tony Stark and Riri Williams tending to this. Now, this raised a couple of continuity issues to me when I was going through here. And I doubt that it was really like a screw up on Nick Spencer's part so much as it may have been a mistake in terms of the artistry or it could just simply be designed to be that way. But Tony Stark, as we know him, is a hologram. There's been nothing to indicate in Marvel Comics that Tony Stark is back in his physical body as a human being. He's still basically an AI. He's an interactive, you know, hologram, interactive computer system that actually serves to be the mentor of Riri Williams as her AI when she's using her own Iron Man suit. And so because of this, the question is, how did Tony Stark get here? Well, there's a couple, a couple answers that we can really just kind of make up here until we get something uh, that, that really explains what's going on. Um, the first to me is that it's basically the AI just using a suit. And it's not that outside of the realm of possibility. The suit is nothing if just not a massive chunk of technology. And so it's entirely possible that Tony Stark could use his AI programming to literally just activate a suit. We already saw him do that in the Riri Williams uh, Invincible Iron Man Volume 1. Like all the different suits were activated by Tony Stark in a training session and attacked her. Uh, we'd seen another suit hijacked by, uh, by Riri Williams and brought into a conflict by Tony Stark. And it was an older model suit. But the fact remains, we've seen that happen. There's a precedence for that. Um, it could also be that Tony Stark is actually back and, you know, this story takes place following Tony Stark's return and his return hasn't happened yet. Or it could simply just be that Doctor Doom's posing as Iron Man and letting everybody believe that he's Tony Stark. Again, there's a lot of questions or a lot of uh, possibilities that exist here right now. But regardless of which one of those that we choose, we do know that this seems to be Tony Stark uh, in, his, in all of his full faculties and his full abilities. Now, the cool thing about this is that we also see some really great villains, historically speaking, in Marvel Comics that are kind of brought in here. Now, some of them appear for a singular instance and we don't ever see him again. For example, Graviton. Uh, Graviton shows up here. He's a guy that can basically manipulate gravity and, and he's a really, really interesting villain. I believe he was in the Avengers, either, either it was the animated movie or the animated show. I can't remember which one it is, but the Incredible Hulk was the only one who was able to overcome Graviton's strength. And Graviton's basically a guy who can manipulate the gravitational pull around an object, meaning he can make something infinitely heavy. He can increase the gravitational pull on something. So where the gravitational 
gravitational pull around you is 9.8 meters per second squared when you're just walking around on the sidewalk on a regular day, Graviton could run up on you and increase the gravitational pull on you, which would increase this to like 50 meters per second squared, in which case you would just flatten out and you would, you would die. But the fact remains, you understand what it is that he's able to do. And so because of this, a lot of different characters are showing up here. We of course have Luke Cage and what's more or less his reformation of the mighty Avengers. You, know, you have Cloak and Dagger and, and, uh, and Iron Fist and a handful of others, you know, and it's kind of cool to see Spider-Woman, different things like that, but it's really more of like a, a kind of run over by Sharon Carter. Now remember, Sharon Carter was the longtime love interest turned second in command to Steve Rogers. Now, of course, she was initially offered the position to be director of S.H.I.E.L.D. He turned it down and Steve took it instead. She said, look, Captain America is the greatest of us. He should be the one to be director of S.H.I.E.L.D. The other half of this is that there are people, there's basically Hydra forces um, gaining, you know, gaining ground and uh, continuing to launch their attack against, you know, various uh, military groups across the world. And so it's all these different plans of Captain America coming to fruition. All these different plans of Captain America all coming together to create what amounts to a worldwide calamity. Now, outside the planet Earth, it's really like the powerhouses of Marvel, right? I mean, you got Carol Danvers, uh, you have the Guardians of the Galaxy, you have the Ultimates, um, you have Hyperion, you have a handful of people who are out there all trying to destroy the, sh the, the uh, Chitauri fleet before it actually gets to Earth. And so they're really kind of doing the best they can, and, and they're doing pretty well, considering the fact that, you know, there's so many Chitauri, but the problem is that it's just a constant wave. It's a war of attrition. As soon as they destroy the first wave, the next one comes. And as soon as they destroy that wave, the next one comes. It's just over and over and over again. Now, the cool thing about this is that this really highlights how effective Captain America is, right? Like, we think of Captain America, and it's like, well, I mean, in terms of powers, he's, he's not that great. He's super strong. He's athletic. You know, he can run really fast. He's, you know, a, a human at the peak of physical conditioning. The true ability of, of Captain America is his leadership. It's his ability to walk into a situation and say, I am now taking control here. I'm running the whole show and be effective at it. And that's what makes him such a such a prominent character. That's why he was always basically the leader of the Avengers is because he was very good at delegating who is best in what situation, given their powers or their strengths or whatever the case may be. And so it's really a combination of things. One, he's speaking directly, you know, with, with Luke Cage and with those guys out on the street level in New York, trying to take down the various villains. He's dealing with, uh, you know, I guess talking to Doctor Strange, who's trying to come or trying to take out the same thing. He's talking to Carol Danvers out in space. Uh, you know, he's, he's rallying a multitude of forces together. The issue with this is that in the middle of this conflict, Nick Spencer actually draws on the original Civil War. And this is a great Easter egg, right? The original Civil War event kicked off because the villain Nitro blew up Stamford, Connecticut when he was ambushed by the New Warriors. That's basically what happens here. Uh, in this instance, we end up having a Nitro doing the exact same thing. Nitro's like, you know what? I'm just going to explode. He ends up blowing up, detonating, uh, you know, in, in an area of New York and killing multiple people. In response to this and this massive loss of life, the U.S. US government makes the worst decision imaginable. Now, this is this is this is the moment when I had to stop the story, right? Like I was going through the comic and I was like, oh my god, I have to stop. I have to pause. <laughs> because the Secretary of Defense contacts Steve Rogers and says, are you seeing what we saw in New York? A massive explosion that took down, you know, that has a huge amount of loss of life and a massive amount of property damage. And Steve Rogers says, yes, but we're trying to get things under control. The Secretary of Defense response is, it's too much for us to basically sit alongside and watch this unfold. It's, it's not enough for you to delegate. You have to seize control. And so because of this, the Secretary of Defense says, the president's been moved to a safe bunker. I've been told to do the same thing. Effective this moment under the United States Shield Act or whatever it's called, we are now giving you full and total control of the United States military. You are effectively the only person in control of the United States. You're the top person now. Everything's been suspended. You are now the one running the show. They have just let the fox into the hen house. And as soon as I, as soon as I saw that, I was like, no! <laughs> You literally just gave the keys to the city to a Hydra agent. Why would you do that? And oh my God. But I think my reaction is a testament to how well this is written because this is hilarious because it's really like, like Sharon Carter and his Captain America that give us these great, you know, these great opposing views of things, right? With Steve Rogers being given absolute control, Sharon Carter says it was only in this moment that we realized, or, you know, looking back, we 
it's only that we realized this was the beginning of the end. We thought we had it locked down, right? Like we thought we had it sorted out. Now everything's gonna come crashing down. What ends up happening here is Steve Rogers speaks out directly to the Avengers and says, hey, look, we knew this day might come. We knew the day might come when we just encounter just these overwhelming forces from a multitude of places for whatever reason. All their attacks just happen to coincide at the same time. But he says, we're going to have to do what we need to do. And so even if it means that we all end up dying in this fight, then let the universe see the fight that we put up here. And so he says, even if it's only for the very last time, Avengers assemble. Now, immediately after this happens, the shield kicks up, right? And the idea of, of Riri Williams and Tony Stark is, okay, what's going on? Why did the shield just suddenly activate? Now, of course, through their investigations, with the shield working, it's really them as the only two people who are doing any poking around because everybody else is celebrating, right? With the shield up, it means the threats are now mitigated. It means the Jatari threat out there, they don't have to worry about that anymore because the Jatari forces are drones. They'll just keep plowing into the shield and dying. And the shield has more than enough power to repel the, the Chitauri trying to invade the planet Earth. And so because of that, now the only concern is what's going on inside the Earth itself. Now, the cool thing about this is that we also get the Unity Squad, right? You know, the, the basically the Avengers X-Men uh, group that kind of exists in the same team. And, uh, you know, it's, it's basically, you know, Synapse and Rogue and, and a handful of others. But it's the Unity Squad. And of course, they show up and they're there to kind of help fight against these villains. And so everything's effectively like, you know, coming to an end, right? It's like, look, the villains are all taking off. The Unity Squad's here. We have all these different superheroes here. The Earth is saved. The Chitauri are basically held off you know for the most part things are taken care of now again the funny thing about sharon carter's uh, commentary here is she says we all allowed ourselves to feel like everything was better we all allowed ourselves to feel like the day was saved it's very similar to the beginning of civil war ii right like there was that giant celestial from another dimension that showed up on earth and the superheroes won and they were like yeah the day's saved the problem with this is that this is when Steve Rogers enacts his plan. And that's what's so brilliant about this, right? It's only when people experience the most crushing loss that they're easier to conquer, that they're, they're at their weakest and their easiest point to conquer. Right when they're riding high, right when they're at their absolute peak, you pull the rug out from under them. And the shock of falling so far, so fast, totally overwhelms them. And that's exactly what Steve Rogers does. The other, the, the, the reason why this happens is because of the fact that we end up having another, uh, another uh, shield vessel show up out of nowhere and they end up realizing this is a shield vessel that had previously gone missing because they believed that it had been taken over by Hydra. Now the assumption at the time was that Hydra had basically killed everybody on board and that was it. Instead, once they're bracing for impact, once the vessels really seem to crash, Hydra agents begin busting in and invading this main helicarrier and this is when Sharon Carter begins to hear the voice of Dr. Faustus. And this is when she begins to realize that Dr. Faustus is basically while well, the second ship was originally taken over and how they're taking over this one. Now, remember, Dr. Faustus is a long-standing villain in Marvel Comics, right? I mean, he's a guy that basically uses hypnosis to seize control of other people. But in terms of what Nick Spencer was doing, he established that Dr. Faustus, alongside, you know, Baron Zemo, uh, Baron Zemo's father, uh, was really just one of these guys that was one of the predecessors of Hydra. They were the ones basically kind of running the scenes, pulling the strings, uh, teaching Steve Rogers to become everything he would need to know in order to become the greatest of the Hydra agents. And so this shows us the eventual plan, the eventual role that Dr. Faustus was supposed to play. He would use his powers of hypnosis, or his, at least his ability to, to, to hypnotize people into basically going through and, and making them Hydra agents. Now, again, it's cool that Nick Spencer is drawing on this, right? Because one of Dr. Faustus' most significant moments was when he effectively hypnotized Sharon Carter back after the events of the first Civil War in 2006, 2007, and had her, uh, had her shoot Steve Rogers, killing him in the first place. And remember, that was the whole death of Steve Rogers. Crossbones fired the distraction shot. Sharon Carter fired the killing blow. And so the idea is really Nick Spencer kind of grabbing some of these themes and throwing them in and it works incredibly well. It works so well and that's what's so so crazy about this and this is when this is when Sharon Carter learns what's going on. When Hydra initially comes busting in, Steve Rogers says, hold your fire and they stop they stop shooting. Now, Sharon Carter's response is, oh my God, what have they done to you? They must have tricked you. They must have taken you. Steve, you have to regain yourself. Steve's response is, this is not what you think it is. I'm, uh, my mind's not been taken over. I haven't been tricked. I'm not under their control. I am a Hydra agent. And Sharon Carter's response is perfect. Panic. Oh my God. Like denial. 
anger. It's exactly what we would expect, right? I mean, she's the person that's closest to Steve Rogers. They were lovers at one point. And even now, they're still extremely close, as close as they're ever going to be. And so because of that, it's like the ultimate betrayal. The man she thought she trusted, the man she thought they knew, or the, 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 that she thought she knew, the man who was the pillar, the moral backbone of the superhero community is a bad guy, is a villain. Now, the reason why this is so huge is for a couple reasons. One, because of the fact that Sharon Carter and Rogers were so close, but two, Sharon's starting to realize the gravity of the situation. Everything that has transpired in the superhero community, everything, Civil War II, the whole idea of the Avengers Unity Squad, every single act that Steve Rogers has been involved in has been for no other reason than to culminate in this moment, him gaining absolute power. And that's the fear of it all, is what happens now because no one but Sharon Carter knows. No superheroes out there but Sharon Carter knows that Steve Rogers is a bad guy. And then Steve's like, take her away. Get her out of here. Now, the other half of this is that because they're close, Steve's like, if anybody harms her, there will be hell to pay. But once she's gone and she's out of the picture, Steve's like, and let it begin. And the walls come crumbling down. The shield that was set up to keep the Jatari out, Carol Danvers calls back and says, look, we have wounded out here. We need them to get back in. Steve Rogers says, no, you're not coming back here. None of you are coming back here. All of you who are out in space are staying out there. That means the Guardians of the Galaxy out in space, Hyperion out in space, Carol Danvers, the Ultimates, the whole nine yards, the powerhouses are out in space. They're not in the picture. And so it's just like, oh my God. Now at the same time, you do have Riri Williams and you do have Iron Man asking the question, okay, look, if this shield suddenly came back online, then why? And the more they investigate, the more they begin to realize someone sabotaged it so that it would only come up at this particular moment. So while they don't know it's Steve Rogers, they do know something's off. And so it's really kind of cool because it seems like Nick Spencer is sort of setting the stage for these two being the ones that basically lead the way to the downfall of Steve Rogers, or at the very least, an attempt to initiate a way to try to take Steve down. Now, the other half of this is Baron Zemo, you know, Helmet Zemo, and a, and a villain named Blackout. Now, Helmet Zemo refers to him as a guy named Bob. As far as I'm aware, Blackout is a guy by the name of Marcus Williams. So I'm I'm not really sure what the whole idea here is with Bob, unless this is Hydra Bob, in which case that would be really, really weird. <laughs> but the idea here is that Blackout's basically able to draw on something called Dark force dimension. And this is really kind of grabbing into one of the, the other aspects of Marvel Comics. There's all different kinds of dimensions, dimensions that are composed purely of energy. That's how Cyclops gets his optic beams. The other dimensions that are just ridiculous, other dimensions that are home to like a villain named Nightmare, who basically just influences and seizes control of people by manipulating their nightmares, but is also insanely powerful. Um, you know, the, the dark dimension of Dormammu, there's all different kinds of dimensions out there. The dark force is basically this massive enveloping force of energy that Blackout can use for the purpose of absorbing things into the dark force dimension. So this is exactly what he does with the city of New York. Now, the abilities of, of, uh, of Blackout are shown to be extreme here simply because of the fact that Doctor Strange with all his powers cannot protect the city of New York. And so this entire section gets absorbed directly into the dark force dimension. Now, these are stages that Steve Rogers taking. Stage one, eliminate Operation Alpha Flight, eliminate the satellite out there, all the forces that could potentially pose a legitimate threat to him due to the amount of power that they have. All those spacefaring guys who are out there stuck outside the shield, that's stage one. Stage two, take over New York City. And this is when things begin to get crazy because then we have Iron Man realizing extremely fast what's going on. And he basically says, if you have, or if you, you know, if you are, or have ever been an Avenger, or have ever done anything with regards to the superhero community, come out here now. This is literally the panic button. This is Iron Man hitting the panic button, sending out an SOS and saying, if you are in any form or fashion a hero, respond right now and come to Washington, D.C. And the reason why is because this is stage three. This is Steve Rogers solidifying his control over the world. Take out the most powerful heroes. Allow the only ones left on Earth, the ones that can pose some kind of a threat, but really not much, and then seize control, seize absolute power of the White House, and then eventually the world. And so really all we have left are whatever heroes are on Earth. I mean, you've got Thor, you've got Red Hulk, you've got Scarlet Witch, you've got some pretty powerful characters. So it's not like Nick Spencer basically just got rid of the most powerful characters in the world. World, but there's still some, you know, there, there's still some legitimate threats, but the most notable ones are outside Earth. So again, it creates kind of a really funny situation because now it seems like it's going to be Iron Man basically serving the purpose of operating as this, this sort of uh, insurgent, like a leader of an insurgent group against Steve Rogers. Now, the reason why this matters is because this feels like this is what Civil War II should have been. That's exactly what this feels like. It feels like it's the other way around. Remember, in the 
first Civil War event, Tony Stark sided with the US government and Captain America formed his own secret Avengers. In this, Captain America is a Hydra agent seizing control of the world. Tony Stark, Iron Man forming his own secret Avengers team would be an amazing answer to this. And so I, I really, I wouldn't be surprised if at some point down the road, people were like, Civil War II didn't happen. What we actually got was Secret Empire. And this is the real Civil War II. Okay, so we're going to be a little bit dangerous here. We are going to, we're going to cover Secret Empire. <laughs> now, I love, 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 love Secret Empire. I think it's one of the best written stories Marvel's had for quite some time. And I really love the way that it all comes together because to me, it tells this incredible story about the superheroes. One of the great things about Secret Empire is it shows how pivotal Captain America is to like the moral focal point of all the superheroes on earth, not just the United States, but all the superheroes on earth. I mean, you gotta keep in mind, Captain America has led a multitude of different groups. It's usually been the Avengers, but whether it's like a small group here and there, or whether it's like his secret Avengers, or whether he fights alongside other superheroes, a lot of people across the world look to Steve Rogers because of his leadership capabilities, because of the fact that he refuses to give up, he never gives in. But the whole point of Secret Empire is to give us a scenario where he turns the entire tables of everything that's happened on his head. Now, of course, we have all the lead up to Secret Empire from Captain America, Steve Rogers. We have part of Captain America, Sam Wilson, but uh, the comments section for a lot of those videos just turn into like racial, you know, arguments and bigotry. And so for the most part, I just stopped doing those videos. So you're welcome to catch up on those on your own. But the fact remains, that with uh, with Steve Rogers, remember, his entire history was basically modified. Steve Rogers, we knew, that was injected with the super soldier serum. He went on to become Captain America. You know, he was frozen in ice for 20, 30 years. He was eventually discovered by the Avengers, thought out, and he became the hero that we all know and love. It wasn't until all new, all different Marvel that we suddenly had uh, S.H.I.E.L.D. basically going through and grabbing all these different fragments of different cosmic cubes that existed over the years, piecing them all together, creating one cohesive cosmic cube that S.H.I.E.L.D. decided to create the, the whole concept of Pleasant Hill. And Pleasant Hill was basically using a cosmic cube to more or less warp reality and create this sort of idyllic prison that villains could be kept in with no idea that they were actually being held in this altered reality, so to speak. And so the result was that when Captain America Steve Rogers and the other Avengers learned about what was going on, it was a complete violation of the civil rights of all the different villains that existed out there. And so they basically broke into Pleasant Hill. They essentially brought the whole thing down, you know, at the same time, there was this big breakout that was initiated and it ultimately resulted in everything S.H.I.E.L.D. had done coming to light by way of Rick Jones, of course, one of the friends of the uh, original Incredible Hulk Bruce Banner, who had basically hacked everything, tipped the Avengers off, dumped the information out to the world, and uh, it resulted in S.H.I.E.L.D. really kind of getting a negative reputation or even worse of a reputation than it had before, but it brought the events of Pleasant Hill to light and it allowed the Avengers to bring it down. But in the middle of all that, we ended up finding out that this Cosmic Cube had become sentient, and it's always been that way. You know, the Cosmic Cube's always become sentient in Marvel comics. In some form or fashion, they end up becoming beings just because of the fact that they're just pure energy that will eventually take on an actual form. The Shaper of Worlds is a Cosmic Cube. Cubic, the original Cosmic Cube. But this one was basically composed of different fragments over the years. And because of the fact that the Red Skull had created and used his own Cosmic Cosmic Cube somewhere along the line, this cube itself, when it became sentient, because it was new, it was basically a child. And as a child, it recognized that one of its fragments had been used by the Red Skull somewhere along the line. And so it began to look at the Red Skull as somewhat of a father figure. And in turn, the Red Skull began to corrupt this sentient Cosmic Cube and used it to not only restore the youth of Captain America Steve Rogers, but to also modify his entire history to make him a Hydra agent. And so because of this, the Steve Rogers that exists now in all new, all different Marvel is a Hydra agent. That's really how all that came to be. Now, of course, again, we go more in depth into that as we go through our Captain America, Steve Rogers stories. But in Secret Empire number zero, he had basically made his first strike and everything had been leading up to that point when he took out, when he killed the Red Skull, when he recruited Baron Zemo to his cause. The whole idea was to bring everything crashing down. Now, the problem that writer Nick Spencer ran into was the idea of the Cosmic Cube itself. If the Cosmic Cube, going by the name Kobik, is the reason why Captain America is a Hydra agent, then all somebody has to do is capture her and try to force her or at least brainwash her into setting things back to rights. And so what he ended up doing was basically having the Cosmic Cube uh, more or less reformed and then eventually just broken into a thousand shards, broken into pieces all over the place by the Hydra scientist, Eric
Eric Selvig, who of course had basically turncoated against Captain America. Now, of course, again, the reason for this was because of the fact that Eric Selvig had basically grown close to Kabik as a little girl, kind of viewing her as a surrogate daughter of sorts. And so the result is that where Captain America wanted to keep her prisoner, if not just sort of remove her away from everything, it resulted in Selvig just kind of dispersing her all across the Marvel Universe so that she could be reformed at some point along the line and her sentience would be restored. So instead of just allowing her to be a prisoner, she was kind of killed, so to speak. That's basically what happened to her character. And so what this story does is it sets the stage for tracking down all the pieces of the Cosmic Cube, or at least that's really what issue number one will do. What this immediate segment of the story does is show us how the heroes failed. Now, again, with Captain America launching his first strike, this came in a couple forms. Remember, Carol Danvers as Captain Marvel had been working on a shield that was designed for the purpose of basically protecting the Earth from exterior threats. Steve Rogers, after becoming director of S.H.I.E.L.D., fired Carol Danvers and then kept the S.H.I.E.L.D project and then turn around and basically initiated this global shield to keep Carol Danvers and all these guys out. And the reason why was because of the fact that remember Captain America Steve Rogers had taken the queen of the Chitauri race, which exists very similar to termites or ants. And the idea was that they would constantly keep coming to try to locate their queen. By keeping the queen hidden on the planet Earth is essentially create an infinite wave of Chitauri forces that would continue to wear down the superheroes that were fighting outside of Earth and trying to keep the wave from penetrating the Earth before the shield went up. The issue was that after having Carol Danvers and all those super powerful beings outside Earth, uh, Captain America immediately initiated the shield, which kept them out. They couldn't get in. And all they were doing is just running into wave after wave after wave of Jatari forces trying to arrive on Earth itself. Now that begs the question, why don't they just leave? Like, why don't they just go anywhere else? In truth, a lot of that's just for the sake of storytelling, just for the sake of showing us what it is that they're doing. But, you know, for whatever reason they don't, if for no other reason, then to just kind of keep the story going. But back on Earth proper, with the forces of high Hydra basically launching their attack across the United States, specifically in New York and the Capitol by taking over the White House, this basically brings in all the superheroes. Now, on the whole, this is basically superheroes versus supervillains. That's really what it is. I mean, it was, you know, initially it was Hydra going to all these villains and saying, look, we know what S.H.I.E.L.D. did to you guys. Yes, you know, I'm technically the director of S.H.I.E.L.D., but we will make a better life for you. We will make a better world. All you have to do is fight on our behalf. And this was designed to be a ruse and a distraction. And the reason why is because, remember, when it comes to the Earth's Mightiest Heroes, when it comes to the Avengers, being an Earth's Mightiest Hero doesn't necessarily mean the most powerful. It means being the Earth's Mightiest Hero in terms of your willingness to keep going, what you stand for, and your moral compass. And so the Avengers would just keep on fighting time and time again, and they wouldn't really worry about the idea of how powerful they were. They would just try to hold everything in check. But even then, there were still some pretty powerful beings here. The new Red Hulk is here. Vision, Scarlet Witch, Miles Morales, Spider-Man, the holographic Tony Stark, uh, Riri Williams, the new Iron Man, you know, I guess going by the name Ironheart, Hercules, Quicksilver, you know, the champions, the Avengers, the whole nine yards, it's everybody doing the best they can to stop the forces of Hydra. And the cool thing about this is we get this really interesting narrative along the way, and it actually comes from Black Widow, which I really feel like Black Widow is getting some of the best treatment in storytelling in this story that she has in quite some time, or at least for the first half of the story anyway. But the fact remains, Black Widow really kind of addresses all this in saying that, you know, as a person without any powers, but prodigious training in conflict, and has consistently been part of like S.H.I.E.L.D. and the Avengers and the superhero community overall, one of the issues that the superhero community ran into was that much like, you know, the human body growing a resistance to various illnesses or to various cures, the superhero community began to basically develop an immunity or a resistance to the idea that they could lose, that they had constantly won against like overwhelming odds. You know, the scrolls would invade the planet Earth and the superheroes would win. Some villain would try to take over the entirety of the, of the world or the United States and the superheroes would win. They always came out on top that eventually a time came when they never thought that they could lose, that they could do no wrong. And that's the cool thing about this is because it's not like the heroes are full of hubris, right? It's not like, you know, it's not Casey at the bat. Well, they throw one ball, you know, and Casey's just kind of sitting there reading a newspaper and they throw another ball and Casey's goofing around and they throw the third ball and Casey strikes out. I mean, it's not them just kind of being arrogant or anything along those lines. It's just the idea that there's this aspect of their personality that they fought so many different villains. They just couldn't really consider themselves to be people who would lose. And that would make sense because think about it. Over the course of Marvel Comics publication history, even before the events of all new, all different Marvel, the first Civil War. Yeah, the superheroes lost, but Captain America died, he created a rallying point, and then we got the events of Dark Reign, one of the darkest eras in the history of the Marvel Universe when Norman Osborn took over Director of S.H.I.E.L.D. The superheroes came out on top when they exposed Norman Osborn as the guy that he was. The Skrulls invaded the planet Earth during the events of Secret 
Empire, creating all these doppelgangers of superheroes, and they came out on top. Thanos wielded the Infinity Gauntlet. The heroes came out on top. You know, all these stories, all these events that took place, the heroes always ended up winning. Yes, there were casualties, but they always won. And it's this idea of Nick Spencer sort of turning that on its head and saying, but what would happen if they didn't? What would happen if the heroes didn't win? Now, the question is how? Because Captain America by himself is incapable of defeating all these different superheroes. He just doesn't have the power to do so. And so what he did is he turned the heroes against each other. And this is designed to feed off the fallout from Civil War II. Because remember, Civil War II was Carol Danvers, you know, Captain Marvel going against Tony Stark, but it fragmented the entirety of the superhero community because it was basically violating people's rights. It was pre-crime. It was, well, they haven't committed a crime yet, but they will, so let's arrest them before they do. And so what ended up happening here is that people began taking up sides. They began saying, no, 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 I'm with Iron Man or I am with Carol Danvers, whatever the case may be. But because of the fact that this happened so soon after the events of Civil War II, there was no time for people to band together. There was no time for them to basically begin making amends for their own actions, put the past in the past and start moving forward. This was an immediate response with the Hydra inner circle, Captain America, Baron Zemo, Arnim Zola, Hive, Kraken and Madam Hydra all basically showing up on the scene. The fact that Captain America is a Hydra agent is a crushing blow to the superheroes because they now have to face the fact that the greatest hero among them is the one that's been working against them. And that's the craziest thing about this because remember, following the revelation or following the altering of reality by the Cosmic Cube and Captain America's past, making him a Hydra agent, every single thing that he did, whether it was a story in Marvel Comics that was removed from the ongoing events and saw Captain America shaking the hand of Old Man Logan, or whether it was something that tied directly into Captain America's own stories, he was always operating in the background. He was always working against the, the superheroes of the, of the Marvel Universe. And so we always had to keep this in mind. Everything was moving towards the idea of him taking over the country. And that's why Civil War II was such a great story from the perspective of Captain America, because with Captain America being thrown into the mix, what it basically revealed was that he was the one the, that initiated the entire series of events. He's the one that set up the conflict between Carol Danvers and Iron Man. He's the one that goaded them into fighting one another. He's the reason why the entirety of Civil War II happened in a lot of different ways and why the superhero community remained split. And so with them facing the fact that Captain America is the one against them, what we end up having are these series of events that aren't fully explained. They probably will be, you know, as the story goes on. But at the moment, one of the first things that happens is Jane Foster Thor is taken out. Because remember, Thor is one of the most powerful characters in the Marvel Universe. With her near invulnerability, with her hammer, her super strength, she's somebody who could easily just become a, a one-woman wrecking crew with regards to, like, the forces of Hydra. Just start, you know, tearing things apart. And so what ends up happening throughout this entire monologue, Black Widow continues to say things like, we fought because we were right but we fell because we were wrong. And so what ends up happening is Jane Foster is effectively made intangible by Vision who's corrupted by the forces of Hydra. The Scarlet Witch is effectively taken over, although we don't really know how it is that that happened. And then ultimately, Captain America is able to reach down and pick up the Hammer of Thor. And that was one of the biggest moments in the entirety of this story. And the reason why is because of the fact that people looked at it and they immediately freaked. They were like, no, 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 no. It says only people who are worthy can lift the Hammer of Thor. How can Captain America pick it up. Well, they admitted how it was that Captain America could pick it up. The hammer enchantment does not say whosoever holds this hammer, if he be a good guy, shall possess the, the power of Thor. It says whosoever holds this hammer, if he be worthy, shall possess the power of Thor. And we know by virtue of the story with Odin's son that the reason why he can't lift his own hammer is because he doesn't believe that he's worthy. Odin's son is worthy to pick up his hammer. He just doesn't believe he is. And so with Jane Foster effectively out of the equation, Captain America wrecks everybody in the superhero community, what's left of the event the whole nine yards and leaves them without any real moral compass. At this point, they're just a broken group and we'll find out how broken they are in Secret Empire number one. Okay, so getting into Secret Empire, uh, this is... Man, this quickly shaped up to be one of my absolute favorite stories that really that I've read in Marvel Comics for quite some time. I absolutely love it. But there are a lot of you guys here who are new, a lot of you guys who probably don't know about all the controversy that's kind of surrounding it. And so what I want to do is sort of explain this a little bit, because there are a lot of people who have been looking around and asking, why are people so upset about what's going on with Secret Empire? For a lot of people, it's not really Secret Empire that they're upset about. It's the idea of Marvel as a whole. What people look at with Marvel is they get angry and they say, okay, Jane 
Jane Foster is now Thor, and Odin's son is just a guy wielding an, an enchanted axe. Riri Williams is now Iron Man, and Tony Stark is just in stasis, and it's this AI that's basically running around everywhere. People look at these changes, and they're basically saying, I'm not being given a choice. I'm not being asked, do I want to read Thor Odin's son or Jane Foster Thor? I'm being told, if you want to read Thor, you're reading Jane Foster. People aren't being asked, do you want to read Bruce Banner Incredible Hulk, or do you want to read Amadeus Cho Incredible Hulk? They're being told, if you're reading Hulk, you're reading Amadeus Cho Hulk. That's the biggest issue that people have. They feel like they're being forced into a situation that they don't want to be in. And if people have the option of either reading something they enjoy or reading something they don't enjoy, they'll choose what they enjoy. But if what they enjoy isn't available, they won't choose anything and they'll walk away. And that's the biggest issue that, that, that people are facing with right now. So Secret Empire initially opens up with the most logical thing, which is indoctrinating kids. And that's one of the interesting scenarios here is because when it comes to taking over any one particular country, it's all about indoctrination. It's all about going to people and saying, hey, take this as an absolute fact and do not ask why. Again, it's one of these things that you kind of see, and that's the purpose of it being in here, is to create relatability, but to also show us how far it can go. Because in order for a society to be successful, there has to be critical thinking. There have to be people who say, but why though? Like that, that has to happen. That always needs to take place. Because someone asking why leads somebody else to say, well, here's the answer. And if they give them an answer that requires critical thinking, then the question becomes, well, then how did you arrive at that answer? And then that leads into the whole investigative process, and that leads into more questions being asked, and it leads to the idea of people just not accepting something as absolute truth and actually asking questions about why things are the way they are. And that's really one of the things that I enjoyed most about this little segment is it's basically this notion of you can't take something as an absolute truth because what had happened is once Hydra took over, Hydra eliminated all forms of, of, of text that they didn't agree with. That was another aspect of totalitarian and fascist, uh, fascist policies. If you disagree with a book, burn it. But in the end, they weren't really just burning a book. They were burning the ideology of critical thinking. They were burning the ideology of saying, I don't agree with this, but I also have to accept that there are opinions out there different from my own. It's more or less kind of purporting this idea of anybody who doesn't think the way that I do is wrong. And so again, that's why this is so significant is because that's effectively what Hydra is doing. Hydra is you know, really just kind of coming along and saying, okay, guys, look, like we now run the show, which means that kids read the books that we tell them to read. Teachers teach what we tell them to teach. The news reports what we tell it to report. It's very much a totalitarian regime. Dissent differing opinions, people who don't see the world the same way that Hydra does, all those people are ousted. Either they're ostracized by society or they're eliminated in their entirety. So again, it's one of these scenarios where it's a very slippery slope. The fact remains, there's actually one of the kids in this class who reports on an inhuman, reports on, I think it's like the older brother of one of these kids and basically saying, look, I saw him doing something kind of weird, only, uh, only for us to find out that, you know, this kid's brother had basically swallowed a Captain America lunchbox in order to get it for his, you know, younger brother and then uh, was basically sought after after by the uh, by the cops, you know, more or less for Hydra society. Now, again, this is designed to show us how bad things have gotten, you know, just because of the fact that in this particular scenario, in humans, are immediately arrested if they haven't registered themselves. And that's kind of an interesting scenario because again, it's creating this idea of individuals who effectively interred and it makes a lot of people uncomfortable because what some people are sort of forced to do, assuming that they actually choose to read the story, is they're kind of forced to realize that there are uncomfortable truths out there. But the idea isn't to ignore uncomfortable truths. The idea is to embrace them and ask, why do they make me uncomfortable in the first place? Again, really feeding into this idea of critical thinking, feeding into this idea of maybe I should just ask why, as opposed to just kind of accepting things as an absolute truth. And so one of the other aspects on this is the idea of the superheroes who were just kind of left out in space. Keep in mind, when Captain America initially launched his campaign and began the process of taking over the United States, the shield that Carol Danvers had worked on, the shield that was designed to keep threats outside of Earth, was enacted. Captain Marvel and a handful of other people out there who were, you know, superpowered beings were basically forced outside of the shield. Now, remember, the reason why this happens is because it would not have done Earth any good if they were like, hey, here's this shield that can protect our planet from everything except for like really powerful people because the really powerful things that are out there are the ones that you worry about. You worry about Galactus, you worry about Thanos, you worry about Gladiator and the Shi'ar Empire trying to obliterate the whole of humanity. The shield is designed to keep out some of the most powerful beings in existence. And so there's really no hope for Carol Danvers or any of their guys to actually get back onto Earth proper. So that means that Hyperion, it means that Blue Marvel, it means that Carol Danvers herself, it means that a lot of these characters who were out there trying to stem off this tide of 
Tachari forces that are constantly invading Earth, or at least constantly trying to invade Earth in order to get their queen, will ultimately lead to them presumably dying in combat. Now, one of the questions that has to be asked here, and this is one of the things that kind of stood out to me, is that if this shield is capable of keeping out some of the most powerful beings in the world, and the Chitari are a race of aliens akin to insects without any insane powers whatsoever, then why don't the forces of Carol Danvers and those guys just leave, go get help somewhere, while the Chitari forces constantly just bombard themselves onto the shield and are inevitably killed each and every time? In truth, it's just Nick Spencer keeping them there. It's just a way for writer Nick Spencer to say, hey, look, we're keeping them around. We want them around here, presumably for this great big huge Grand Poobah conflict that takes place at the end of everything. And so from this point, what we do is we actually pick up with a kid named Ray Sean and we actually join the champions. Now, one thing to keep in mind, and this is why this is really kind of cool, is because of the fact that this is designed to show us or at least give us an indication that the superheroes are really on the run. I mean, there's really no hope. Now, we'll find out how hopeless a lot of them perceive things to be here in a little while. But at the moment, you know, where this kid, you know, Ray Sean is basically rescued by the champion. So by Miles Morales and by uh, Viv, the daughter of Vision, and by, you know, Amadeus Cho Hulk and so on and so forth, uh, where he's whisked away, we actually pick up in Denver with some giant monster that's, you know, wreaking havoc. Now, this is not anything new and, and really we're not even given the origin of this monster and we don't have to worry about it. This is one of those things where Nick Spencer kind of plays it fast and loose with the old school Marvel style of storytelling. And what I mean by that is back during the 1960s and the early 1970s, back when Marvel was coming out with a lot of new superheroes, you really didn't see a lot of big crossover conflict of uh, conflict events like you do now. Instead, with the way Stan Lee and a lot of the earlier, uh, earlier writers, Roy Thomas and, you know, Jerry Conway and Steve Englehart, the way they used to write those stories back then is while they weren't the most lighthearted, they were a lot lighthearted than they are now. And so you would see, you know, Captain America fighting off, fighting off against like the snake monster, or you would see Thor against like the molten man, you know, or something along those lines, but you wouldn't see like these great big, huge, grandiose things. And so it's really kind of hitting at this idea that there are still various threats out there. The difference is how they're dealt with. When it came to the traditional landscape of Avengers, they wouldn't normally obliterate these things. Sometimes they would, if the monster just couldn't be reasoned with, if it was like a, you know, a very primal intelligence, it couldn't understand speech patterns or anything like that, or if it was just such a violent being that there was no way to no way to defeat it outside of killing it then sure they would fall to that level but for the most part it was always like contain capture and then hold it prisoner in this instance that doesn't happen instead the hydra avengers jump in and just kill the thing. Now, one of the things that I want to address here are some of the members of the Avengers. The Deadpool is straightforward. It's all about cash. When it comes to uh, to Superior Spider-Man, or I guess the return of Superior Spider-Man, it's more or less just the idea of, you know, being on the devil's right hand than in his path. The same thing with, you know, with, with uh, Odin's son. Now, there is a little bit more to Odin's son than we'll actually find out. We'll really get around to issue number four or five, and we'll actually find out there's a lot going on with this character that we're not being made aware of. But remember, Scarlet Witch has been corrupted, although we don't, we don't know how yet. Well, at least we don't know how in issue number one. In issue number four, we find out, and we can spoil this a little bit. I mean, it's not a great big, huge revelation. It's literally just like a one panel thing that shows us. But with the Scarlet Witch, uh, she's basically been corrupted by a demon named Cthone. And Cthone was the being that gave her her powers in the first place, or at least, I guess, established a lot of the abilities that she's currently capable of. The problem with this was that with the character of Scarlet Witch, it was always this ongoing battle to keep Cthone at bay, much the same way that Doctor Strange tries to keep like Dormammu at bay. The issue is that we don't really know how, but somewhere along the line, the Scarlet Witch's ability to fight off the essence of Cthone was basically hampered or eliminated in its entirety, and Cthone has totally taken over the body of Scarlet Witch. So, in truth, while this is Scarlet Witch, it's not really Wanda Maximoff controlling her, it's Cthone uh, controlling her, which this is actually kind of cool, because what it does is it creates a redemption element for Wanda Maximoff herself, which could actually tell some pretty compelling stories. Uh, at the same time, you know, where these guys are basically rounded up pretty fast, or I'm sorry, where they uh, defeat this monster pretty fast, what we do is we actually pick up with this pretty interesting revelation in the sense that while there is a lot of fascist things taking place, the idea that inhumans are rounded up if they refuse to register, there's also the idea that the country's better off than it was before. And again, this kind of creates a little bit of a false corollary in the sense that can a country really be better off under a totalitarian regime? And the answer is yes, it actually can. Countries are nothing more than a byproduct of people who hold power and the people who try to keep that power from corrupting everything. The people versus the super rich, if that's how you want to call it. But 
The idea here is that with a singular person or a council running the show, restricting freedom from everybody, then the emphasis or the issue doesn't necessarily become people will have the free will to like buy homes they can't afford and things like that. Instead, they will walk where we tell them to, they will do what we tell them to, or at least a, a large enough majority will that you don't really have to worry about it. And then from there, it's a matter of now, how do we keep them under control? And that is the genius of this. It would have been very easy for Captain America and his forces to implement this policy where there's just like tanks in the streets every day, cops stationed outside people's houses, and they follow them everywhere they go, but they don't do that. Instead, what they do is they say, what we need is to give people a reason to want us to stay. It's not enough for us to take over. We have to give them a reason to cheer for us. And so by eliminating monsters, by creating shovel-ready jobs and improving the employment levels, by creating a more stable economy, that's how they keep people there. By creating these peace accords, by bringing, uh, bringing conflict to an end between the United States and various other territories that are out there, that's how all that ends up happening. They basically say, look, we've made the country almost infinitely better. And so ultimately, it all ends up coming down on the shoulders of the people. What are you willing to sacrifice in order to make the world a better place? Are you willing to give up your freedom to make the country better? For a lot of people, the answer is no. You ask them that question and without a second guess, the answer is no, absolutely not. They, they refuse to give that up. In their mind, you know, and in the minds of a lot of people, it's I'd rather live in a free society that destroys itself using its own freedom than have a long life in a totalitarian society. Because what happens when that council that does everything to benefit society as a whole becomes a council that decides to tear society down? They become evil. They become corrupted. They become crooked. Well, then suddenly we have no choice. We don't have the ability to do anything. And that's the argument that they make because while things are down and out in a free society, while they're not necessarily the greatest thing ever, the freedom that that society has allows them to make it better. That's the difference is that ultimately it all comes down on the shoulders of the people and what they're willing to do and how they're willing to make things work in order to make them better. I mean, the civil rights movement happened to a degree with regards to government regulation in terms of new laws being passed and so on and so forth. But it wasn't soldiers in the streets marching on behalf of African Americans and multiple cultures that were out there. Instead, it was the American people that were marching out in the streets. It was the American people making their voices heard. When it comes to, you know, the whole idea of like, you know, Marvel's shift to bring back a lot of the older characters that people wanted to see return, it wasn't government policy that made that happen. It was people who were saying, I'm not going to read what you're putting out until you bring back the characters that I want to see. It's ultimately the people that make those things happen. And so that's one of the other benefits of this story is because it shows us that at the end of the day, it all comes down on the shoulders of people doing the right thing or doing what they believe to be right to make society a better place that ultimately keeps it better for the long haul. So again, it's really kind of a cool scenario here. Now, one of the other things that really hits on here is the idea of what's going on with the X-Men. Uh, all we're really told here is that there's a, there's a sort of treaty between Hydra and the X-Men in the sense that the X-Men are given their own autonomy. They're given their own section of the country where no one's allowed to affect them. You know, it's one of those you stay away, I stay away kind of things. And that makes sense. When it comes to like Marvel comics, Marvel's really been given like the X-Men kind of the crap into the stick. And so it's, it's one way to kind of, you know, smooth things over with regards to the fan base in terms of like, okay, look, you guys don't want the Inhumans. We won't really give you the Inhumans and we won't punish the X-Men for being the X-Men. We're not going to make them like the butt of all the heinous experiences of Hydra. Instead, we'll just have them kind of off in no man's land. Within the realm of Marvel Comics, some of the most powerful beings that exist on the face of the planet are mutants. And so, I mean, if you're Hydra and you're running the show, do you really want somebody who can warp reality screwing it all up for you? <laughs> do you really want to piss off a guy who can transmute matter on the atomic scale just by looking at it? Is that really a guy that you want against you? Or is that a guy that you want either neutral or on your side? And so again, it just kind of makes good sense with regards to the, to the role that Hydra's taking. But with regards to the whole idea of, you know, the traditional superheroes themselves, or the, the Avengers, as we normally think of them, uh, what we end up doing is, of course, we pick up with Ray Sean and the Champions once they arrive back at the old Avengers, or I guess the new Avengers headquarters, kind of this old abandoned bunker where Hydra wouldn't really look for them or anything like that. But we end up finding out that things are actually pretty bad. Like, things are on the pretty down and out, just because of the fact that Ray Sean actually shows up alongside the Champions, who have just kind of made this, grab this kid, and then just brought him over. But once he says, look, you know, I have some information that was handed to me by a guy by the name of Rick Jones, don't really know who he is, but he told me to give it to you guys because he could win the war. The Avengers send him off to meet Tony Stark. Now, the reason why is because of the fact that, remember, Rick Jones was the guy who leaked all the information about Pleasant Hill, the scenario where S.H.I.E.L.D. was using a cosmic cube to manipulate the
manipulate the reality around it and trick all the villains into thinking that they were kind of living in this idyllic paradise. And so because of the fact that Rick Jones was basically forced into S.H.I.E.L.D. custody after the event of Pleasant Hill and, and you know, in lieu of serving a prison sentence, he was able to gain access to all kinds of information, especially after Hydra had taken over S.H.I.E.L.D. and the United States. And so what he had done is he had grabbed all these little bits and pieces of information, consolidated them into a single thumb drive, gave it to Rayshon, and then sent Rayshon on his way to go meet the Avengers. And so during his conversation with Tony Stark, it's actually kind of an interesting scenario because Tony Stark's usually always the futurist, like the idealist. He's always thinking one step ahead or two steps ahead or 20 steps ahead or something like that. But in this instance, Tony Stark has basically given up. Now, the reason why this is kind of cool is because there's always been this sort of antithesis between Tony Stark and Captain America. They represent yins and yangs. They're always opposites. And it has been since Civil War. Civil War for Captain America and Iron Man was the Dark Knight Returns for Batman and Superman. It was the seminal story that basically established that they're always going to bump heads forever. They're never going to agree on anything in an absolute way. And so much like the original Age of Ultron story where Ultron had basically taken over the world and uh, Captain America had effectively given up until he come up, you know, until he came up with an idea to go find one of Nick Fury's bunkers, Tony Stark's much the same way. He's like, look, we can't fight, man. All we can do is just hide. We can just live from one day to the next, do the best we can, and then just call it quits. You know, just go on for as long as we can until Hydra catches us or something along those lines. And so again, it's kind of an interesting scenario because what it tells us is that while some people have given up, others haven't. And the reason why is because of the fact that we end up learning that with this whole scenario of Steve Rogers more or less being a Hydra agent, during a meeting or I guess a dinner that he has with Sharon Carter, there's still a little bit of humanity left in him. And that's one of the reasons why this is so interesting is because when it comes to Captain America, he's not wholly evil, right? Like he's not inherently evil, like, yes, I am like Vlad the Impaler and I'm just going to like kill everybody or something like that. You know, it's nothing along those lines. For him, it's really more about the idea of he genuinely thinks that he's doing the right thing. He genuinely believes that he's actually making the making the country a better place, which in a lot of ways he is, minus those individuals who are being, you know, tortured or executed. It's the whole idea of he's genuinely trying to make the country a better place. And so because of that, uh, what he ends up doing, or at least when he's talking to Sharon Carter, is of course, it's basically told to us that Rick Jones had been captured following his leaking of all this information to, uh, to Ray Sean, which eventually made his way to the Avengers, and in an attempt to demonstrate that he's still the Steve Rogers that Sharon Carter knows, or at least in the sense that he still has some shred of humanity, she actually asks him to let Rick Jones live to basically spare his life because remember he is basically on in sentence for execution he's going to be killed and so the coolest thing about this actually comes directly from Rick Jones himself and the reason why is because he's the guy who just will not give up Captain America gives him an option and says look all you have to do is say hail Hydra that's all you have to do all you have to do is just say hail Hydra and you'll go free now this seems like a small thing, right? Like it seems like a tiny little thing. Like all you have to do is say Hail Hydra, but it's the idea behind it. It's everything that it stands for. Saying Hail Hydra means Hail Hydra. It's a couple of words. The words in and of themselves don't necessarily mean anything. It's the meaning behind them that has all the significance. If Rick Jones says Hail Hydra, then it means that he's effectively given up, that he said, okay, look, I guess Hydra really has won. But so long as he does not say Hail Hydra, it means that Hydra can be defeated. There's at least one person out there, even if he's moments away from being killed, who still believes that Hydra's not right, who still believes that Hydra can fall. Not only that, because of the fact that a lot of people are aware that Rick Jones had basically leaked all this information out regarding Pleasant Hill, that he's the one that basically was able to attain the information and send it over to uh, to the Avengers, the Avengers themselves now see him as something of a martyr. And so where he's told, all you have to do is say, hail Hydra and you'll live. Instead, he responds, Avengers assemble. And the reason why this is so important is because of the fact that now he's a martyr. Now he's a he's the uh, cause. Now it's if we do this, we got to do it for Rick Jones and the other people like him. His name will always come up. He's going to be a champion of the rebel effort in order to overthrow a uh, Hydra proper. So that's why this is so interesting. And so ultimately we pick up with Madam Hydra herself. Again, the reason why is because of the fact that we're actually going to learn there's a lot more about her than is initially depicted here, but she was the one that had come along when Steve Rogers was a little kid and recruited him into Hydra in the first place alongside his mom. And so the question or the issue that Captain America faces right now is on one hand, with regards to Rick Jones, he's doing what needs to be done. But on the other hand, Rick Jones stands for something much larger. These little rebel excursions, these little attempts to tear down Hydra, these guerrilla warfare tactics all stem from the idea that there are still people out there who believe that Hydra is wrong, that Hydra can be taken down. And so what ends up happening is this inner circle, you know, Kraken, Dr. Faustus, Hive, Arnim Zola, these different guys all basically say, the only thing that we can do here is we've got to crack down even harder. We've got to make things even tougher. We have to show them that if they cross us, that we are 
going to execute them. We're going to destroy everything they know and love. And so Captain America is kind of torn here just because of the fact that if he gives in to Hydra, to the Hydra Council and says, yes, you're right, it makes them look weak. But if he doesn't give in, then it makes it look like he's weak on, you know, people who are basically being rebels. It's a no win situation. And so ultimately what he does is he takes his hand out of the equation in its entirety. He gives the authority to Madam Hydra, to Elisa, to basically go through and implement the act that's going to show the strength of Hydra in the face of those who would attempt to challenge Hydra's leadership. And so when the Avengers all gather outside of Las Vegas to see what in the world's going on, Hydra emerges with their massive warships and begins leveling the entire city. They destroy the entirety of Las Vegas, Nevada. All right, so getting into Secret Empire Part 2, God, this story just gets better and better. I mean, this story is absolutely phenomenal. I feel like it's one of the best stories that, that, that's really come out with Captain America in a long time. Uh, but again, you know, this, this really picks up with the aftermath of the destruction of Las Vegas. Now, keep in mind, for the superhero community, they've been holding on by a thread, right? And that's the significance of Secret Empire. That's the basis behind Secret Empire. The Secret Empire, I imagine, on some level, is supposed to be political. It's supposed to be like a reflection of the modern day politics. I don't worry about that side of it. I just want to enjoy the story for what it is. And the idea of superheroes basically being pushed to the point that they feel like they just literally can't win is very indicative of Old Man Logan, of this just dark atmosphere, this dark future where things are just grim and nobody can really come back from it anymore, specifically in the realm of New York. Keep in mind, we saw in the free comic book day version in Secret Empire number zero that New York was just kind of sucked into the dark realm, you know? So because of that, there's no light here. I mean, it's just this, this dimension where there's nothing but dark darkness and the darkness is permeated by these monsters that seek nothing more than to kill anything they come across. And so all these inhabitants of New York City have just kind of descended into absolute madness. And this is where things get absolutely beautiful because we initially pick up with uh, really just kind of a handful of those individuals, those heroes that were in New York at the time that it was whisked away. So Doctor Strange, uh, Iron Fist, Luke Cage, so on and so forth. And it's really kind of cool because it gives these minor heroes a chance to shine. I mean, as cool as Luke Cage is, as cool as Iron Fist is, at the end of the day, they're still pretty low on the on the totem pole when it comes to like the hierarchy of popular heroes in the realm of Marvel Comics. Honestly, Netflix, you know, whether people loved it or hated it, Netflix shined a lot of light on the character of Iron Fist, where previously people didn't even know who he was. And so again, it was really kind of an interesting concept, but it really also shines a lot of light, no pun intended, on the character of Dagger. Because remember, Dagger has the ability to create these sort of psychic hard light constructs, so to speak, but she's basically the only source of light in this dimension of darkness. The reason why is because of the fact that for the character of Doctor Strange, his efforts are almost always on trying to get them out of there. And so he really can't exhaust all of his energies. Instead, Dagger serves as the perfect beacon, as a, as a perfect source of light for anybody who's trying to make their way throughout this city. And But the issue with this is that where initially she was able to extend this power for hours and hours and hours and for days on end, it's taking this you know psychological toll. Her body's perfectly fine, but the idea of standing at the top of the Empire State Building and just emitting herself as a beacon of light for hours on end is psychologically taxing. And that's one of the great things about Secret Empires because it's more than just superheroes fighting superheroes. It's more than just good guys versus bad guys. It's the psychological effect that this has on heroes being put in such weird and strange situations. Not only that, it actually allows villains to shine in a way that they normally never would. And the reason why this happens is because of the fact that we actually pick up with a church and there's a handful of criminals that kind of break into this church just because of the fact that this church has been getting resources in the form of medicine, and different things along those lines. And where some of these hoodlums break in with the intention of robbing this priest, a guy suddenly shows up, kills one of the criminals, and begins going on this amazing monologue. He basically says, you know, why are you here? And the idea is, well, you know, it's, it's you know, we're, we're getting what we want. Uh, we were going to give you, you know, your your cut of the, of the profits and all that kind of good stuff. But then it's basically revealed to be the kingpin. And the idea here is that the kingpin really plays this incredible role. It's almost indicative of the kingpin from the Netflix Daredevil series, which I love Vincent D'Onofrio's kingpin. He was... I think he's really one of the best villains that Marvel's ever had in the history of their Marvel Cinematic Universe. I think he's probably the standout villain. But the idea here is that he plays very much the role that we're used to. If you're not familiar with Kingpin, for you, he's probably just a foe of Spider-Man, a foe of Daredevil, and that's really about it. But when writers actually take to task and write him as a great villain, he 
is something to behold. He is just beautifully done in this particular story. And the reason why is because of the fact that he, he basically kills these criminals and he tells the priest, your, your church is under my protection now. I will make sure that you want for nothing. If you need medicine, I will give you the medicine you need. If you need food, I will give you the food that you need. If you need water, if you need any kind of resources, I will be there to give it to you. But when everything comes back to normal, when we get back to the, back to the normal state of things, keep in mind who it was that kept you alive. Now, this is how Wilson Fisk works in a lot of different ways. Wilson Fisk, in a lot of instances, will just like strong arm his way into stuff, right? Like he'll just show up and just be like, and this is mine now. But in some instances, he'll just kind of work his way in and he'll intertwine himself into these particular scenarios and then basically start calling in favors later on down the line. But what this also does is it creates a measure of loyalty. It's really some people for the, you know, in this instance who will look at Kingpin and say, well, he's not nearly as bad as I thought he was. I mean, he helped to keep us alive. He made sure that we had the resources that we need. He kept bandits and criminals away from us. I mean, we don't really owe him so much as we respect him in the way that we're going to make sure that we uphold our end of the bargain, that we treat him with this measure of respect. And so it really turns into something akin to affection, more so than like loyalty or, or the belief that he somehow owed something. And so because of this, we kind of transition out of this dark realm and we actually pick up with, uh, with Tony Stark himself. Now, again, one of the cool things about Secret Empire is it very much picks up on the state of the Marvel Universe at this point in time. And coming out of Civil War II, regardless of, you know, whether you love him or hate him, Tony Stark was just one half of the argument with Carol Danvers on the character of Ulysses. Again, I have that Civil War II video down in the description. We're not going to go too far into it. Civil War II is not a very good story. But the idea here is that Tony Stark made his own enemies among the superhero community. But the events of Secret Empire do not distinguish which side anybody was on. It's not like Captain America said, okay, I'm taking sides and we're going to start splitting people up. So the people who are going to be, you know, siding with Tony Stark or who are going to be stuck here with Tony Stark are going to be the same ones who supported him during the events of Civil War II. It's not like that. When the events of Secret Empire popped off and Captain America made his move and he started just checkmate after checkmate after checkmate and shutting down all these different superhero groups, just eradicating them or imprisoning them or whatever the case may be, it ultimately meant that he was just superheroes scattering for the winds and hiding as best they could. And so what it meant is that at that point, following the events of Civil War II, Tony Stark in a lot of ways was surrounded by enemies. This is also compounded by the fact of just Tony Stark's history. Superior Iron Man, where he was just an absolute dick to everybody. His history of alcoholism, his actions during the first Civil War. Tony Stark has consistently made enemies among the superhero community in a lot of different instances. And so because of that, a lot of those enemies really haven't let those issues go. They haven't really walked away and said, yeah, you know, I mean, bygones be bygones. It doesn't really work that way. For a lot of people, they still absolutely hate him. And so what he does is he basically kind of calls this truce and he says, okay, look guys, I know a lot of you guys don't believe me. I know you guys, a lot of you guys don't really think that I'm a guy who's trustworthy. That's fine. Let's let Rick Jones speak. And of course, Rick Jones recorded this message, you know, before he had died. But the cool thing about this is that Rick Jones is positioned as this one guy that everybody trusts because he was the last guy to shout Avengers Assemble. He was the one guy who wouldn't give ground, who wouldn't give up, who wouldn't walk away from the idea of what it meant to be a superhero. And so the result of this is that what Rick Jones basically does is get us caught up on everything that had happened so far. That, you know, S.H.I.E.L.D. was messing around with recreating a cosmic cube. The cosmic cube was just a fragment or I guess a combination of different fragments from other cosmic cubes. The result was that one of these fragments belonged to a cosmic cube that the Red Skull had previously attained. When the cosmic cube was reformed and the whole Pleasant Hill event kicked off and all that kind of good stuff and the Avengers and the media became aware of the fact that S.H.I.E.L.D. was basically tricking the minds of different villains into believing that they were in a paradise when they really weren't. When the this assault on Pleasant Hill event took place and Kabak had basically gone through and began the process of de-aging Steve Rogers and changing his entire backstory at the whims of, uh, of the Red Skull, then ultimately it set all these events in motion that allowed Captain America to operate behind the scenes without anybody ever knowing he was a Hydra agent in the first place. Now, the kicker to this is that where Kabak had eventually gone on to join the Thunderbolts under Bucky Barnes, this led to a direct conflict between Captain America and Bucky Barnes. Captain America killed Bucky Barnes. He also killed the Red Skull. And then in turn, Eric Selvig, the guy who was basically the science head next to Captain America working alongside of him, basically dispersed the shards of the Cosmic Cube all across the world just because of the fact that the idea was that Captain America was going to take this Cosmic Cube and make Hydra a reality. That is to say, alter, you know, the very fabric of reality itself so that Hydra was in charge of everything. It was basically going to speed boost his way all the way up to the top. And so the result is that with these shards kind of scattered all throughout the world, now it's a hunt for the shards of the Cosmic Cube. It's almost akin to Dragon Ball Z and the Dragon Balls. You know, everybody's hunting for these, these shards of the Cosmic Cube. The result is that where Tony Stark and his forces in the midst of mustering themselves together in order to race off and achieve this goal, Captain America is doing the exact same thing. Remember, Steve Rogers is none too happy about the idea that he had to display this extreme show of force by wiping out 
about Las Vegas, but it was necessary for him to do that, or at least for him to order it done for the very purpose of showing the fact that he's willing to do whatever it takes in order to make sure that Hydra stays in control. Now, the other half of this is remember, Baron Zemo is like his man in the corner. I mean, this is his right hand man. Baron Zemo will basically carry out virtually any task that Captain America asks him to. And that's why Captain America goes to Baron Zemo and says, I want you to track down the shards of the Cosmic Cube. I want you to leave no stone unturned, none. Do whatever you have to, kill whoever you have to, but do what needs to be done and get me this shard of the Cosmic Cube. Now, the other half of this is that we actually pick up about 24 hours after all this in Colorado. And the reason why is because of the fact that Natasha Romanoff had basically raced off with the intention of both, you know, grabbing these shards and at the same time trying to track down and kill Captain America. The issue with this is that she's eventually located by the champions themselves. And this is really cool because the champions basically go to her and say, look, you have a level of training that we couldn't even begin to comprehend. And that's true. With Natasha Romanoff, she's got no powers, but she does have prodigious training when it comes to espionage. I mean, she's really the world's greatest assassin. And so because of that, the champions going to her is basically saying, look, we need you to train us in a way that we've never been trained before. We've been trained to defend. We've been trained to stop threats. What we need is training on how to kill threats. And this again, is designed to show us that there's just this tipping point, this point at which everything just kind of switches, that it's not necessarily the superhero landscape that we're used to anymore, that things have gotten darker, things have gotten grittier more so than that, things have gotten desperate for the superhero community. And so because of this, what ends up happening here is we basically have Natasha Romanoff simply saying, welcome to the Red Room. That's what we're going to do. We're basically going to switch over to this idea that I'm going to train you in the exact same way that I was trained. So it's really kind of a cool concept. But in the midst of all this, what we do is we actually switch to this weird location, this weird place, which we now know as the vanishing point. But the idea here is that there's just some chick just kind of running for her life. You guys will notice the art style is distinctly different. This girl's running for her life, right? Just kind of fleeing these weird things. It looks like members of the Serpent Society or what have you. Once they actually descend on her and they intend to kill her, these guys are all defeated by some unnamed person. But when this person is addressed by this woman, when she asks, who are you and what do you want? This man simply answers by saying, my name is Steve Rogers and I'm just trying to get home. Comic book fans, members of the Rob Corps, and people who stumbled across this video. Man, I left you guys on one heck of a cliffhanger last week. Man, you should have seen those comments. People were like, no, <laughs> no, <laughs> it was hilarious. But if you thought that cliffhanger was bad, man, wait till you see what we do at the end of this video, man. Anyway, so, uh, so Secret Empire, all right, to me, there's two kinds of comic book stories. There's good comic book stories, ones where you're just like, oh yeah, I mean, it's kind of cool, you know? And then there's like amazing comic book stories. I don't really consider there to be like bad comic book stories because everybody's got something that they enjoy about one story for the most part. Like I know people who hated a Spider-Man clone saga and I know people who loved it. So there's no absolute truth when it comes to, to stories. That's why I say there's good and then there's amazing. But uh, in the last video, when we did Secret Empire number two, we had basically run over this idea that Captain America, I guess, you know, Hydra Captain America, Steve Rogers, was basically consolidating his power. He was, you know, trying to figure out how to be an effective leader of Hydra while dealing with the politics of it all. Because there were members of of the Hydra Council who were basically saying, hey, look, you have to make an example of the various superheroes out there. There are some that you just have to kill. Whereas Steve Rogers said, look, if we start killing off everybody, then the general public will turn against us. And that was the beauty of it all. That was the beauty of the whole thing is it was walking this very tight line. Steve Rogers has always historically been extremely good when it came to tactics. Whatever the case may be, he always knew the right direction to go in order to effectively win or at least try his best to win. And he was really good at rallying people to his cause. And when he basically, you know, his whole past was rewritten and he effectively became a Hydra agent, or at least that seemed to be the case. The idea was that when they came to power, they said, okay, look, there are things that we can do. We can curb, you know, what it is that people can and can't do, but we have to give them the illusion that they stand some measure of success. And that was the reason why the internet was maintained, even with Captain America as the head of Hydra and Hydra being this, you know, fascist dictatorship that was basically running the show. Let the people have the internet. If the people have the internet, they'll have their own little groups and their own little organizations and they'll have have their little, you know, guerrilla warfare tactics and they'll be stopped occasionally, but you let them go through with their plans that won't actually do anything. They can launch these, you know, little battle tactics and so on and so forth. They can take out a few Hydra forces here and there, but in the end, it's one step forward, two steps back. They just don't know that it's happening. That's the goal. Give people the illusion that they're succeeding and they'll keep on fighting. And basically you'll be able to maintain your own, your own empire. So again, it's really G 
genius in terms of how it all unfolds. But what this ends up doing is this jumps back to the idea of the whole vanishing point. That's really the only indication we've been given of what this place is. And this is where we left off on the last video because we have Hydra Captain America who's basically dominating the entire United States. And then suddenly we have this place off somewhere that looks like a fantasy land where we've got another version of Steve Rogers. We don't know who this Steve Rogers is. We know nothing about this guy. All he knows is he says, my name is Steve Rogers and I'm trying to get back home. Now, of course, this coincided with the arrival of just some girl. We're not given this girl's name. We're not given, you know, her relevance, her significance. What's important here is that she's there to basically juxtapose this version of Steve Rogers with the version of Steve Rogers that we've seen before, the one that's currently running Hydra. And the reason why is because of the fact that Captain America as a concept is not lost on writer Nick Spencer. The whole idea of Captain America is that he's an ideology. He is a perspective. He's a viewpoint. He stands for something greater than just a guy with a shield dressed in the American flag running around fighting on, on the side of freedom. That's the whole nature of this. Is this designed to show us that this is basically the Steve Rogers that we all know? And the reason why we get this is because this girl simply asks, do you remember how you got here? Do you know what's going on? Do you know what this place is? Steve Rogers' response is no. He has no clue what this is. The only thing he recalls are the basics, his military training. And that's the only explanation we need that this is the Steve Rogers that we for the most part know and love. Because remember, when the whole origin of Hydra Captain America was being rewritten, this was basically removed. And instead he was brought up and he was trained by Hydra. And so again, these are two completely different origins for these different characters. And that's how we differentiate between the two. Now at this point, again, we basically jump over to the idea of Peter Quill. And this is kind of funny because remember with Captain America, Steve Rogers, I guess with a uh, Hydra Captain America going through and initiating this shield that's capable of blocking out virtually any threat, the shield itself took into account virtually every force that the Earth had ever come across, Galactus, these various alien races, so on and so forth. And so it made sense that they would create a shield that would be designed to withstand those forces. Of what use would it be to make a shield to protect the Earth if they didn't take into account people with almost godlike levels of power that should be able to get through it? But with Peter Quill and the Guardians of the Galaxy, or at least Peter Quill, Rocket Raccoon, and Groot going out and trying to basically find people they can rally to their cause, what this does is it brings in the perception of Earth with regard to the rest of the universe. Now, again, this is not new. The Earth has always been viewed as a place that the other alien races across the universe absolutely hate. That goes all the way back to the Chris Claremont era of the X-Men back in the 1970s and 1980s. It's always been that way. The Earth basically houses these superheroes, some of which have insane levels of power, but the Earth never really takes into account how their actions affect the rest of the universe. And so, again, because of this, it's always one of these things where the Earth's battles, the Earth's problems, ultimately spill out onto the rest of the universe and all these other different alien races either have to play mop up duty or they have to try to basically run and flee for their lives in order to avoid everything that the earth is screwing up. So again, this unfolds exactly as we would expect when Peter Quill basically says, hey, look, here's everything that's going on. Uh, Captain America basically turned out to be a bad guy. He seized control of the United States. He created this giant shield around the earth. We need your help in order to basically try to find a way to take down the shield, whether it's using your technology or whatever the case may be. And they all say no. <laughs> and not only do they say no, they all start attacking Peter Quill because again, it's their chance to basically take the earth down to keep it isolated because that's the nature of this. Peter Quill is basically making the argument and saying, hey, look, this won't stop here. Like Hydra Captain America, they're going to start turning their attention to all of you. Now, keep in mind, for the most part, all of these races have all manner of technology that could easily be used to basically destroy Hydra. But at the same time, Captain America has some pretty formidable heroes on his side as the head of Hydra. Not all of them are there because they want to be, but regardless of their motivations, they are fighting on his side. And so again, it's really kind of a cool scenario because it brings in this question of how far is Hydra Captain America really willing to go in order to ensure that he can basically bring peace to Earth and then eventually the universe. Now, at this point, we switch over to a guy by the name of Frederick. And Frederick is not very relevant at all. Frederick Myers is a guy that goes by the name of Boomerang, and he's literally like Captain Boomerang from DC Comics, except a lot less interesting. What it's designed to be is it's basically here to show us this is very much like the Old Man Logan story. Remember, in the Old Man Logan story, all the Earth superheroes died, and villains who would have normally had no real role in society whatsoever suddenly found themselves rising up and carving out these little niches for themselves where they could have their own little, you know, quote unquote, empires. Hydra doesn't really care what goes on on the ground level. Hydra's out up in the sky, they're up in the clouds. So long as they maintain their control, they don't really care what happens on the surface. And that's what's going on here. With guys like Frederick Myers, this is a small time criminal who managed to basically kind of 
wheedle his way into this huge amount of success just because of the fact that there's really no superheroes that are willing to step out and fight anymore because either they're being rounded up by Hydra or they're just being killed on sight. And so it gives him this chance to basically carve out his own little niche. Now him meeting with Natasha Romanoff with Black Widow is actually designed to orchestrate a meetup between Black Widow and somebody else. And this person is revealed to be Maria Hill. Now something that I want you guys to notice for a lot of you guys who are not familiar with Marvel Comics, this is one of those Nick Fury moments. If you've been reading Marvel Comics for a long time, you know that like the original Nick Fury before he became like, you know, the unseen, the old school Nick Fury, the white guy with the eye patch and so on and so forth. He was one of these guys where he was always like the last man standing. If everything went to pot, Nick, uh, Nick Fury had all these bunkers stationed all around the world and he would just go there. He would gather intel. He would wait it out. He would do whatever it was that he needed to do. Maria Hill is much the same way. Maria Hill is a character who basically found her huge claim to fame when she became director of S.H.I.E.L.D. prior to and was director during the events of Marvel's original Civil War story. Everybody hated her. Like people hated Maria Hill during Civil War. People were just like, God, man, I wish Maria Hill would die. But that was a testament to how well her character was written. But she basically stayed director of S.H.I.E.L.D. for a little while. After Civil War was over, uh, Tony Stark became director of S.H.I.E.L.D. Eventually he was removed. Norman Osborn became director. Then he was removed. And then Maria Hill took his place. And then of course this led into all new, all different Marvel with Hydra Captain America orchestrating things behind the scenes so that Maria Hill would be ousted and then he would take her place and then initiate his whole plan to take over the United States. But she's always been one of these characters that's very Nick Fury-esque in terms of how she functions and how she operates. She's able to use what little intel she has at her disposal in order to basically grab the calendar of Steve Rogers. Now on the surface, it seems totally irrelevant, but the reason why this is important is because of the fact we actually jump over to Steve Rogers while he's speaking with the members of Hydra's council. These members of Hydra's council represent different aspects. Some are in charge of social media, some are in charge of the military, but the idea here is that Steve Rogers is still on the hunt for the shards of the cosmic cube. Remember, those were destroyed. It's really the only way to basically fix everything and set things back to the way they're supposed to be. We end up finding out that one of the shards resides in Atlantis, and so that's why this is all happening, is because with the calendar of Hydra Captain America, effectively the former Avengers, that's what we want to call them, basically know exactly where he's going to be at any given time during the day. And so they know exactly where he's going, what he's going to be searching for, the whole nine yards. And this is actually going to allow both teams to converge and encounter one another during the next issue, which is actually going to be kind of cool. But the other thing about this is that, remember, Namor the Submariner is hiding to a degree. He's trying to marshal his forces. While they're going around and capturing these shards of the Cosmic Cube, Arnim Zola tried to invade Wakanda and was almost immediately repelled. Black Panther waged absolute pandemonium against them. With regards to Namor the Submariner, while the forces of Baron Zemo and those guys are trying to get in there, ultimately, it's always just backing up. It's backing up. It's always running off, hiding, whatever the case may be. Because remember, Atlantis is very much this uncharted place of Earth in the Marvel Universe. Really, only Namor the Submariner knows the most about it, just because of the fact that he kept it so secret and would so often refuse to allow anybody to come down there. And so this, of course, results in, in Hydra Captain America saying, fine, if he wants to run and hide, then we'll take away his places to hide. And they just bombard Atlantis with nothing but just rockets and these different weapons. And so again, where the question is asked whether or not they need to follow up with the next location, quote unquote, of course, Hydra Captain America's response is, no, I will take care of this on my own, only for us to find out that this location is the current residence of Ultron and all new, all different Marvel. So again, they're all basically going to be meeting up with Ultron in the next story. At this point, I want to kind of backtrack for a second, and I want to pick up with Sam Wilson, because remember, Sam Wilson was the all new Captain America, but following Steve Rogers' rise and the reveal that he was a Hydra agent, Sam Wilson basically quit. Plus, it was also because of the fact that people were giving him a hard time after a while. So this is one of those situations where he just says, you know what, I'm effectively done. And he currently operates as a smuggler, getting people out of the United States to territories that are still considered to be free. But notice this is that he points out the fact to everybody else. He says, hey, I don't know if you guys notice, but no one's out fighting in the streets. There's no revolutionary fighters anymore. People have effectively given up. And so again, it's one of these funny situations where it's like, if people really cared that much about their freedom, they would fight for it to the bitter end. The fact that they're not fighting for it means they don't care that much about it. And if they don't care that much about it, then their current situation is what they deserve to have because they're just rolling over. Otherwise, 
they would be fighting against it. People don't really care about who it is that's running the show, so long as things aren't bad for them. And that's not an unreasonable expectation. It's not an unreasonable stance. So long as they can put food on the table for their kids, so long as people are being rounded up, but it's not them, well then suddenly then it's, it's not a great big huge deal. So again, it's one of these, these crazy things where it's like people sort of, you know, stick their head in the ground, ignoring the situation getting worse and worse. And then one day they're gonna wake up and just realize that their life's about as terrible as it's gonna be because Hydra Captain America <laughs> made things a lot worse than they could have been. Now, following up with Sam Wilson as he's leading the various, you know, members of Tony Stark, or I guess hologram Tony Stark and these other Avengers revolutionaries out to Brazil where Ultron's going to be. Now, again, for the most part, not all of them know this is going to be the case. But what we end up doing here is we actually jump back to Frederick Myers for the last tale bit of this story. And this is really, really cool because Frederick Myers, the guy who orchestrated this meeting between Maria Hill and Natasha Romanoff, gets up to go to the bathroom only to find out that there's a mine planted against the window or I guess against the glass, the mine goes off. And the question is, once he's set upon by whoever it was that planted this mine, his question is, who are you? What do you want? This guy's response is the best way to end a story ever. He says, I could be any number of things. Vengeance, terrible and swift. I could be the guy that could bring everything that you love crashing down around you. I'm the guy who could end your life in a heartbeat. I could be your punishment. And then Frank Castle, the Punisher says, hail Hydra. I told you this is gonna be a cliffhanger. I'll be honest. I love seeing your all's reactions to cliffhangers. I love seeing how you guys react to things because you all usually freak out. You all are usually like, no. <laughs> but if you thought the cliffhangers that I left you on so far were bad, wait till we get to the end of this video. <laughs> because <laughs> this cliffhanger is nuts. So here's the deal. If you're just now joining us with Secret Empire, there have been a couple of things that have happened so far. The long and short of this is that the cosmic cube that was used to basically alter Steve Rogers' memories, to make him into a Hydra agent, to basically alter his past, the fragments have been redistributed and just split throughout the rest of the world. And no one really knows exactly where they are. At this point, it is Tony Stark's rebel team and Captain America's Hydra team trying to track down these fragments. Now, of course, they have different motivations as to why. Captain America wants to track down the fragments and basically restore the cosmic cube so he can alter all of reality and basically recreate the universe in the image of Hydra. Tony Stark wants to go through and use the cosmic cube to basically fix everything and undo Hydra's rule. So it's pretty simple in terms of how it unfolds. But what we end up doing here is we again pick up with the vanishing point. Now remember, the vanishing point is a story that we don't know anything about. We have no idea what this is. All we know is that it's just some place that we just picked up up with at some point along the line. But what threw everybody off is that where the entire run of all new, all different Marvel basically told us that Steve Rogers, Captain America, as we traditionally think of him, had his history altered to make him a Hydra agent, the vanishing point gave us the correct Steve Rogers, the classic Steve Rogers. And so the idea seems to be hinting here from Marvel that the Hydra Captain America is not the real Captain America. Now how this consolidates and how this comes together, we don't entirely know. And the reason why this is so significant significant and the reason why it raises more questions is because as he's making his way through this vanishing point, classic Captain America, as we're going to call him, is basically met by the arrival of a couple of foes. Now these foes are not significant, it's Batroc the Leaper and a few, uh, really some of his most notable uh, notable enemies over the course of his publication history, but he's suddenly met with the arrival of Bucky Barnes, the Winter Soldier, and Sam Wilson. Now this is huge because Bucky Barnes was basically killed by Captain America, which led to you know a lot of the events that are taking place in terms of the, the dropping of the Thunderbolts and, and so on and so forth. Sam Wilson is still alive. And so the question is, what version of Sam Wilson is this? All we know is that we now have these three characters. Now this is kind of cool because remember, historically speaking, when it comes to Marvel Comics, this is the trifecta of the Captain America landscape. You have Steve Rogers, you have his sidekick Falcon, and you have Bucky Barnes. All three of these guys have at some point over the course of their life been Captain America. That's the uniting factor between the three of them. Classic Steve Rogers, classic Captain America, America was Captain America for years and years and years and is thundering outside. Uh, you know, of course, Sam Wilson was Captain America in all new, all different Marvel and Bucky Barnes became Captain America following the death of Steve Rogers after Civil War was over, the first Civil War event. So all these guys have been Captain America somewhere over the course of their life. Now, at this point, we switch over to Natasha Romanoff. Now, this is not a great big, huge thing. This is Black Widow. It's a small little segment.
segment here, but this is basically the idea that remember Black Widow is a tried and true assassin, spy, whatever you want to call her. She's a jack of all trades and probably one of the most dangerous people in existence. The issue here is that the champions team, the team of teenage superheroes who broke away from the traditional Avengers before Secret Empire started, basically joined forces with Natasha Romanoff for the purpose of learning how to become as good as she is. The issue with this is they got into it not knowing what they were getting into. Natasha Romanoff does not play with any kind of interrogation or anything like that. If you have information she needs and you're a bad guy, she will torture you or she will kill you. She will do whatever she has to do in order to get that info. The champions are not really used to that. Remember, the charter of the champions was instigated under the idea that they basically wanted to help people. Where the Avengers showed up into cities and the Avengers fought bad guys and then just walked away and said, well, you know, the government will clean it up. The champions idea was we have to fight the bad guys, but then we also have to make sure that people are able to get back up on their feet if their homes were destroyed or something along those lines. And so they basically wanted to fulfill the entire role. Now, what this does is it basically begins to pick up after the events of our last video, when we had Captain America's team and Tony Stark's team trying to track down the fragments of the Cosmic Cube. And this ultimately leads them to Ultron. Now, this is kind of a cool thing because remember, this all really goes back to the Rage of Ultron story. And if you're not familiar with that, which we have not covered it, a uh, comic story and cover that, Rage of Ultron was basically a story that was out of time. Marvel released it and then didn't tell us when it happened. What they did is with all new, all different Marvel, they rolled that over and put it in continuity, meaning they actually gave it a time frame. But what Rage of Ultron basically established was the idea that Ultron had effectively returned. Ultron was back and he created like these robot versions of the event Avengers and different things like that. But the idea was that the story concluded with Hank Pym and Ultron being merged into the same being. And it made sense because Hank Pym was the creator of Ultron. And the two have always had this sort of unique situation, a very much father and son kind of relationship with each other. But it was only a matter of time before we saw that kind of an event take place. Now, following that, Ultron appeared a couple more times. Eventually he showed up in all new, all different Marvel. He fought against the Avengers Unity Squad, which was Captain America leading like Deadpool, basically a combination of mutants and inhumans working together. But the idea was that following that event, Ultron had basically just kind of been, you know, shot out into space or something along those lines. And then we never really knew what happened to him. What this does is it picks up following the Uncanny Avengers story. And it tells us that at some point, somewhere along the line, out in the middle of Alaska somewhere, Pimtron, as we want to call him, basically just began building this massive city and creating all these Ultron robots. Now, this does beg the question, what would have happened if he launched an attack against the superheroes? In truth, he probably would have been unsuccessful. Captain America, would have been banking on that, or at the very least, he would have been prepared for that because Ultron has been an enemy of the Avengers for so long. He would have just kind of adapted to his own schemes and eventually defeated Ultron. But the idea here is that Pimtron's just kind of waiting in the background. And that's kind of a cool scenario here because when they initially show up and Iron Man's team ends up fighting Captain America's team, Ultron steps in and basically makes them all stop. Now, it's kind of a funny scenario because we end up getting some pretty interesting debates and also answers to some questions that we've had. Most notably, what's going going on with the Scarlet Witch. Well, one of the cool things about the Scarlet Witch's character, historically speaking, is that her mind was always successful in keeping Cthone at bay. Cthone was just like this wildly powerful demon that always wanted to latch onto and use the power of Wanda Maximoff. But the idea was that he was never really able to seize total control of her. Now, of course, in this circumstance, by some means that's never really explained to us, Cthone was able to take over Scarlet Witch in her entirety. Now, whether this was because of the fact that Scarlet Witch had a psychotic break when Captain America first launched launched his strike, whether it was because of the fact that somebody messed with her mind, we don't really know. All we know is that the demon Cthone has taken over the Scarlet Witch, and that's why Wanda Maximoff ended up siding with Captain America. The cool thing about this is that Hank Pym begins to sort of address these various issues that the teams have, and essentially saying they both believe they're right. They both believe they're coming out on top of this. They both believe they're doing the right thing. But the question is, who is actually right here? Is it Captain America as a Hydra agent who believes that he's basically going to save the world by effectively eradicating all the superheroes in existence. And if it goes on long enough, Hydra Captain America will basically be ruling a cinder. But at the same time, the superheroes really kind of brought this on themselves. And that's the point that Hank Pym makes. He says, look, you guys have been fighting forever. You guys have been fighting for so long. The infighting, it's always been there. It's always been a thing. The only difference here is that enemies came fast and loose. And so you always had time to basically put your differences aside and focus on those bad guys. But now you didn't have that opportunity. Now, one of the guys shows up and basically 
proclaims themselves as being a villain and all your chickens are coming home to roost. Now, the other cool thing about this is that Tony Stark begins to goad Hank Pym. And this really hits to the nature of his character because what he basically ends up saying here is that Hank Pym suffers from this constant inferiority complex and he always did. That was the nature of his character. He stood alongside titans of the industry like Tony Stark and his Iron Man armor. You had Thor, who was basically a god. You had the Incredible Hulk, who was a man among gods. Captain America, who everybody looked up to. There were always these superheroes that everybody idolized or had some insane amount of power for whatever reason. And then you had Hank Pym, who could shrink or grow. And that was it. Because of that, it always instilled this inferiority complex. This combined with the fact that Hank Pym created Ultron and the fact that Hank Pym hit his wife, Tony Stark begins bringing all of these up, which in turn leads Hank Pym to basically lash out. Now, of course, in this moment, this basically allows a sort of Ultron and Hank Pym personalities to negotiate, for lack of a better word, which allows Hank Pym to essentially retake his mantle to kind of get back to being normal, more or less. But what ends up happening here is that when he sends everybody along their way, and when he ends up speaking with Captain America, one of the cool things that happens here is he addresses the nature of the end result of what will happen. Remember, with the character of Ultron, while Captain America could likely defeat him, it would be a long and arduous journey. And even then, I may very well have been kind of overshooting it a little bit when I say that Captain America could defeat Ultron, because that brings into the question, well, what happened in the Age of Ultron event? So with regards to Captain America and with regards to Ultron, what he basically says is even if the Ultron personality wanted to conquer everything, it wouldn't behoove him to do that. It would actually make the most sense to let them destroy each other. This is really cool because what this does is it hits home at a quote that came from a movie called The Sum of All Fears, when it had this guy who was basically a Nazi and he was trying to find a way to take out the United States and Russia. And one of the things that he said was that Adolf Hitler was stupid. Back during the events of World War II, he said, you don't fight the United States and Russia. That's crazy. That's suicide. What you do is you get the United States and Russia to fight each other and destroy each other. And that's the beauty of, of Ultron's ultimate goal here. Why fight Captain America and Tony Stark at the same time? Why fight their enemies at the same time? They're going to fight until they're all dead. So why not just let them kill each other and then conquer what's left? Napoleon Bonaparte did the exact same thing. I mean, historically speaking, when it comes to any successful conquest, dictator, emperor, whatever the case may be, they all practice some pretty key, uh, key themes that are for the most part unique. Napoleon Bonaparte would go into countries, start civil wars, wait until their countries were at their weakest, and then conquer them. That's how he expanded his, uh, his empire so fast. And so, again, this really hits at the idea of Captain America having effectively obliterated the entirety, or at least one major temple of the Atlantis Kingdom, which resulted, of course, in Namor the Submariner handing over his piece of the Cosmic Cube. Again, that was really kind of like that little thread that was effectively coming to a close. But what also ends up happening here is we get this little piece of information where we basically find out that there's someone on the inside of Iron Man's team. There's basically a mole. This also picks up with the idea of, uh, of Natasha Romanoff of Black Widow. Now, we don't see the full extent of what it is that, that, that she's doing. Instead, what ends up happening here is that she basically leads the champions to infiltrate a Hydra base, but also the idea that she basically picks up with a villain named Viper. Now, Viper was a character who got her claim to fame really as just one of the notable enemies of various super hero teams. She wasn't, wasn't really like a great big huge villain, but she was one of those who kind of hung out in Madripoor, different things like that. She had a pretty cool role when it came to the death of Wolverine. But the idea here is that it hits home at the notion that not everybody who sides with Captain America does so because they genuinely believe in his cause. Viper is an opportunist. She exists to make money. That's her goal. If she can make cash off war profiteering, that's exactly what she will do. And what's happening here is that with Hydra basically running the show, she's running a narcotics ring. And it's kind of cool because she's doing it under the scene. She's doing it without Captain America knowing that it's happening. And of course, Natasha Romanoff says, hey, look, despite Captain America being a Hydra agent, he runs a pretty tight ship. And if he finds out that you're running narcotics, he's going to kill you. He's going to use you as an example. He's going to string you out there. And that's going to be the end of you and anybody who has the same ideas that you have. And so it's one of these cool little moments with these characters. Where we basically see these small little tidbits coming out about the things that are going on under the surface. Now, of course, this also coincides with Tony Stark traveling to Wakanda. Wakanda received one of the shards of the cosmic cube when it dispersed across the planet Earth. The difference here is that one of the Hydra agents, uh, Arnim Zola, who's really part of the inner council of Hydra, has been trying to infiltrate Wakanda over and over and over again. Fighting against Wakanda is not just walking into some primitive African territory somewhere and then just taking it and then just running off. You're basically trying to infiltrate the most technologically advanced country in the world. Technology that's well beyond anything that most of the planet Earth actually 
currently has. Again, what ends up happening here is this hits home at the history of Iron Man. And it's kind of cool, this exchange between the two of them, because initially Tony Stark approaches uh, Black Panther and says, hey, give us your shard of the Cosmic Cube and we will basically fix everything. Now, of course, Black Panther's response is no, we'll just basically wait it out. And of course, Tony Stark's response is, well, if you do that, a time will come when there will be nothing for you to wait out. When eventually Captain America's forces won't be held back. You're facing against what amounts to a garrison trying to break into your place. But what happens if the full might of the Hydra army is brought down on Wakanda? Are you really going to sacrifice the entirety of your people for the sake of a cosmic cube shard? But what Black Panther basically responds by saying is that every time Tony Stark tried to do the right thing, he always screwed things up. Case in point, the original Civil War event. And that's the cool thing about this. Tony Stark was like, well, hey, look, you know, if superheroes are fighting supervillains, it's only a matter of time before the government gets tired of it and then just makes all superhero activity illegal in its entirety. So I'm going to basically support the passing of the Superhuman Registration Act and the hopes that other superheroes will get on board because it's for the greater good. Instead, what Tony Stark did is instigate one of the greatest political, social, and superhero calamities in the history of Earth. And so again, it's one of these cool moments when it comes to the history of Tony Stark coming home to roost. And it hits home at the nature that no one really trusts him. Now, again, what this does is it follows up with the rest of Tony Stark's team traveling to all these different locations, to these different places for the purpose of tracking down what they believe to be these shards of the cosmic cube, explicitly because of the fact that Tony Stark has this device, supposedly, that tells them where the shards are at. Now, of course, what we end up finding out here is that this thing has been wrong time and time again. They've captured two shards, but they expected to find four or five more, but they haven't. And the question is why? Well, no one really knows the answer to this. All they know is that the device of Tony Stark isn't working effectively. Now, at this point, we switch over to probably one of the coolest moments of the story, which is basically dealing with the X-Men. Remember, during the whole Secret Empire event, the X-Men are out in New Tian, which is basically this new land they've created for themselves where no one bothers them. Now, in truth, this is done for a couple of reasons. The first is because, well, you know, the mutant population isn't what it was before the House of M, so they're still real from the aftermath of that. The other half of this is that when it comes to the mutant population, they're still pretty powerful. Mutants, by and large, in Marvel Comics are consistently the most powerful community of characters in Marvel Comics. I and mean, you have a wide array of different abilities, planet-wide telepaths, telekinetics. You have people like Gambit who can charge virtually anything he sees and blow it up. You've got Cyclops with optic beams that can slice a mountain in half. You've got all these different characters and all these different abilities. But what Captain America does here is he actually plays it pretty smart. And it's one of the coolest quotes he brings Hank McCoy over to where Thor's hammer is at. And the question is asked, why haven't you ever done anything with it? And Captain America's response is, whenever you went to these old kingdoms and you would have these kings who would have their swords above their throne, it wasn't to tell people, yes, I'm willing to use it. It's to tell people they did use it and they used it to gain their empire. And that's basically what Captain America does. It's an intimidation technique. He basically brings Hank McCoy over to the hammer of Thor and says, hey, look, I'm just a man. But with the power of Thor, I can bring New Tien to its knees. I can literally destroy everything that you guys love and that you guys care about. And sure, some of you guys might take me out. But in doing so, and along the way, I will crush what little hope you have left for restoring the mutant population to what it used to be. Just something to think about if you decide you don't want to hand that shard of the cosmic cube over to me. That's one of the cool things about this. It's manipulative, cunning. And when the question is asked why it is that Odin's son even sided with Captain America in the first place, what Odin's son does, or at least what we get, is this cool explanation. Odin's son pays his allegiance to the Hammer of Thor. He does not, you know, hold any allegiance to Captain America. But the idea is that Captain America was worthy of lifting the hammer. And so because of that, Odin's son effectively looks at this and says, if Captain America is able to wield the hammer, the hammer finds him worthy. If the hammer finds him worthy, then who am I as unworthy Odin's son to stand in his way? Now, this is cool because what this does is it seeds doubt in the mind of Odin's son. It seeds doubt in the mind of the fact that he actually believes that what Captain America is doing is right. Now, this is really, really important here. And the reason why is because remember, Jane Foster is out in some other dimension somewhere. It would not be that far beyond the realm of possibility that suddenly Odin's son gets back his ability to wield the hammer and with the power of Thor rains hellfire down on Hydra. And the reason why I say that, the reason why I say that kind of crazy impossible scenario could be there is because when we switch back over to Iron Man and we switch back over to the conversations that he's having with these other members of, uh, of his own team, when the question's asked, why isn't your device working?
working, the response that's given is it never worked. It was never designed to work. What the superheroes needed was hope. They needed to believe that the thing would actually work. And so what he did is he basically analyzed and used what little information they got from Rick Jones at the beginning of the Secret Empire story. When Rick Jones said, well, here's the best intel we have on where the shards may be. And basically began to kind of go through all these swerves and all these turns to make it look like the box was leading them to where it was that they were supposed to go only for it to be revealed. That's not the case. Not only that, we actually end up finding out that the person on the inside, at least it seems to be the person on the inside is Mockingbird. That Mockingbird is the Hydra agent spying on Tony Stark's team. So again, this is huge because what it means is that there are folks all over the place. There are people siding with all manner of individuals against Tony Stark. And what ends up happening is that in this last little bit of a strike, they basically begin to assault the fortress of the rebels. What last little vestige of hope they have left is rapidly beginning to vanish in smoke. And so what we do <laughs> as we get to this last little bit of a cliffhanger is we join with Captain America, Bucky Barnes and Sam Wilson. As they're making their way again through this vanishing point without us knowing what it really is, they're basically set upon by various traps that have been set by some unknown man, only for us to find out that these traps that have been set have been placed there by the Red Skull, who has every intention of basically continuing its campaign to kill Captain America. But the true beauty of this story, the true little cliffhanger here, is that Captain America begins to have this conversation again with Arnim Zola. And what they basically reveal here is that this massive shield, you know, this compound of the Avengers can easily withstand this assault from Hydra. And so what they need, what they need is a force of unrelenting fury. They need a force that can bust in, that can smash the place to pieces, and that can easily force all the different superheroes out. And so in the last tail bit of this discussion, we have Captain America walk into a room and say, Bruce Banner, it's good to see you again, old friend. God, so I will be honest, Secret Empire just keeps getting better and better. I mean, damn, this story is so good. I've been telling people ever since like Captain America was revealed to be a Hydra agent that this will go down as one of the greatest runs in the history of his character. It's so different. It's so dynamic. I mean, I get that there are those who are just who just don't like change and that's fine. But I think this is just this is one of the greatest runs in his character that there's ever been because the way this ends is insane. Now, remember, for those of you guys who are joining us for the first time, we kind of have two stories going on simultaneously, right? Like we have what's going on out in in the real world, which is Hydra Captain America basically trying to eliminate the last vestiges of the Avengers, which is basically whatever superheroes managed to evade capture by Hydra and are basically hiding out in Nevada alongside Tony Stark, trying to find the remnants of the Cosmic Cube so they can use it to basically adjust reality and fix things back to the way they need to be. But then we also have what's called the Vanishing Point. Right now, we don't know anything about the Vanishing Point. In the next like three videos, we'll know a lot about the Vanishing Point. <laughs> And we will know just how cool it is because, dude, it's, oh my God, dude. I, I, I really want to talk about stuff that's going to happen. <laughs> I really want to talk about future things, but it's it's really, really cool. It's it's a really cool set of events. But the indication here, at least in the early stages, at least as we, you know, as we see it right now, the vanishing point seems to be where heroes go when they die. That really seems to be the case because for the most part, all the characters that are here are basically dead. The only exception to that was Sam Wilson. Bucky Barnes was killed in the events leading up to Secret Empire. Red Skull was killed in the events leading up to Secret Empire. And even this, you know, classic, as we call him, classic Steve Rogers himself, is, you know, metaphorically dead and he's been replaced with Hydra Captain America. And so that's the question that people are asking. And that's the question that I cannot answer is, is Hydra Captain America even Captain America? Is all this going on inside of his own head or is it a wholly different location? Is it actually just another dimension? Is it something taking place inside the shards of the Cosmic Cube? These are answers that we don't have, or I guess questions we don't have the answer to in this video. We'll have answers to that question later on. But the idea here is that this again focuses on the nature of the fact that classic Steve Rogers has basically just been taken prisoner by Red Skull inside of the uh, inside of the, the vanishing point. So again, at this point, we switch over to New York City. Now, remember, one of the things that we had talked about is the idea that New York City had basically been whisked away to a place called the Dark Zone or the Dark Realm or whatever you want to call it. But it's basically a place of total darkness. The only source of light that exists comes in the form of Dagger. And she's basically a character that can kind of create like these hard light constructs to a degree. She's basically serving as this light 
atop the uh, Empire State Building as a way to basically light the city as best she can. The problem with this is that the use of her powers takes a physical toll on her body. Her entire body goes into creating light. The more she does it, the more it burns her out. She's pushing herself to the point of exhaustion. And so because of this, what we end up finding out is that Stephen Strange is basically trying to find a way to access a, a spell or something that will break them out of this whole dimension. Now, one of the crazy things that happens here is he initially addresses a guy called the Librarian. And I've never heard of this guy before. I don't really know anything about him. I've poked around online and I cannot find like a thing on this guy, the Librarian. He's virtually non-existent. The only way that I can think this character really makes any kind of sense is if we were to come to the conclusion that uh, writer Nick Spencer is basically drawing on Jonathan Hickman's whole idea of the Sinner's Market. Now, the Sinner's Market was a concept that was invented, I believe, during Hickman's Avengers and New Avengers. And it's basically this, this other dimension, this other dimensional place where people who can delve in the mystic arts can go to in order to basically barter life energy for power. Now, there's other things that go into it in terms of just being able to buy like black market spells and things like that. That's really what it is. It's just like a giant black market when it comes to mysticism and magic and different things like that. But that's the only sense that I can make with this guy. But again, with Stephen Strange, what he's basically trying to do is just find some spells that will let him break out of this whole dark dimension area. Now, of course, at this point, we switch over to one of the coolest engagements, which actually takes place between Kingpin and Daredevil. And the reason why is because with New York City having been whisked away to this dark dimension, what is basically done is this allowed whatever criminals remain in the city to basically run rampant. And so it's really just Daredevil trying to corral them all in, trying to get everything back together and basically call it a day. But the other half of this is that Wilson Fisk never does anything out of altruism, which is to say, because it's the right thing to do. Wilson Fisk, always want something in return. And that's really the, the situation that's being brought here. When Daredevil jumps in and basically defeats a handful of Wilson Fisk's men who are basically taking all these different medicines and so on and so forth, you know, the question is asked, why is Wilson Fisk helping these hospitals and these, these churches and so on and so forth? Why is he contributing to that? And the answer to Wilson Fisk is because when this is all done, they will remember. Wilson Fisk has always tried to make New York City his own kingdom. And in a lot of ways he has. I mean, we had Daredevil during the whole Shadowland story and then we basically had Kingpin picking up the pieces and using what was left of Shadowland to form his own empire which is kind of cool basically corralling the hand for those of you guys who are following the whole Defenders Netflix thing essentially what seems to be going on with the Defenders is the Shadowland story minus Daredevil being possessed by like the beast the you know entity that the hand basically worship that's really the only difference everything else seems to be pretty much the exact same I could be wrong but that basically seems to be the case that Defenders is going to be Shadowland and if it is is, I am hyped because that story is so good. But the idea here is that if Wilson Fisk cannot take over the city of New York through force, then why not take city, the city of New York by winning the hearts and minds of people who were there? The idea was that mobsters would basically win over neighborhoods. They would win people by giving them things so that people would be less likely to rat out the actions of the mob. When the cops come walking around and asking questions, what's this guy been doing? Have you seen anything suspicious? People will say, no, everything's been fine as far as I'm concerned. And the cops can't make their case. Wilson Fisk is walking this exact same line. Win the hearts and minds of the community and the community becomes yours. On a larger scale, win the hearts and minds of New York and New York becomes yours. And so again, it's this really cool concept. But at this point, we switch back over to Red Skull and his whole interrogation with classic Captain America. Now again, the implication that's given is that classic Captain America does not know who the Red Skull is. And that again, raises even more questions. If this is classic Captain America and this is Red Skull, how does classic Captain America not know who Red Skull is? They've been fighting forever and ever and ever and ever. And that's one of the things that Red Skull brings up. Everything that's transpired up to this point is because of this war that the superhero community has been fighting forever. They've been fighting for eons and eons amongst each other, amongst other villains, so on and so forth. It's just been going on and on and on and on. And so when the question is asked, is it possible to escape this place? The answer given by Red Skull is that the only place to escape is through pain and through death. Now, of course, this transitions over to the champions. Now, remember, when it came to the champions, they were basically coming out of the Avengers. They looked at the Avengers team and they said, the problem with the Avengers is they go in, they fight villains, and then they give no thought to what happens afterwards. The role of the champions, which is to say, basically these younger teenagers, more or less young Avengers effectively, was to come through and say, okay, not only are we going to defeat the villains, we're going to help people rebuild because that's what superheroes should be doing. And the way in which this transpired was just by virtue of them, you know, doing what they could when they could. But when Secret Empire ultimately 
ultimately popped off, they basically ended up, you know, siding against Captain America, joining Iron Man, which eventually led to them joining with the ranks of Black Widow, who harbored this idea of just killing Captain America because of how villainous he was. But what ends up taking place here is that some of the members of the champions do not see eye to eye with what it is that Black Widow is doing, specifically because of the fact that Black Widow is making some friends out of some pretty unsavory enemies. Case in point, Viper. Like we talked about in the last video, Viper was a pretty minor villain. I mean, she just kind of appeared off and on, different things like that, but she was a criminal first and she was a human being second. And the idea was that when Secret Empire basically began to happen, when Captain America instituted his Hydra regime, Viper, as part of Hydra, began running her own narcotics ring, basically buying and selling drugs. And the result is that if Captain America were to find out, he would basically have her executed. The problem with this is that with uh, Black Widow basically going to Viper and essentially saying, I know everything that you're doing, I know what's going on, with Maria Hill doing the exact same thing and then basically passing this information on, it resulted in the idea that the, the champions are now allying themselves with effectively a villain. But that's the nature of war, right? Like the enemy of my enemy is my friend. It's not clean, it's not clear cut. And that's the difference between the champions and characters like Black Widow. Initially, Black Widow kind of looks at this and says, well, it's our fault that we did this. It's our fault, you know, that we basically just got into conflict after conflict. It's our fault that we were fighting amongst each other so much. We failed to see that the most significant enemy was the one that we didn't expect, i.e. Captain America as a Hydra agent. Black Widow looking at this and saying, we brought this on ourselves. But Black Widow also recognizes that the fires of war are not absolute. There's no good guys and bad guys. There's the guys who think they're right and then the other guys who think they're right and they're both fighting each other. But when you're the champions, when you're young, when you see the world through rose-colored glasses, you don't see how it is. You see the world how you would like it to be. And regardless of how you would like the world to be, the world is a certain way. And because of that, the champions haven't quite stepped into the notion of realizing that it's all it's not just black and white. There's not good guys and bad guys, that there's all different shades of good guys and there's all different shades of bad guys. Black Widow needs to kill Captain America and she'll ally herself with whoever she needs to in order to make that happen. But for the champions, right, wrong, or otherwise, they stick to their guns and say, no, Viper's a bad guy. We do not ally ourselves with bad guys. But again, when the questions also raise as to why they broke this old man out of a hospital, the answer is not given by Black Widow. Now that old guy is actually gonna be pretty significant. He's gonna be a pretty huge character when it comes to the forces of Black Widow trying to topple Captain America. I really can't emphasize how important he is. And I'm kind of curious what you guys think. Who do you guys think that old man is? This is a guy that's going to help turn the tide. It's really going to help move things in a new direction. But of course, the idea here is that we switch back over to Hydra Captain America. What we end up getting is this great monologue from him, which he's always got many amazing monologues in the story, alongside what it is that the Avengers are doing. And what we end up finding out is that the forces of Tony Stark basically have this massive bunker they've been operating out of. And the bunker was designed to withstand the strength of, uh, of Thor. It was designed to withstand the abilities of Vision to phase through solid matter. It's designed to withstand virtually everything the Avengers could uh, could account for at the time that all this is going on. Captain America basically says it was only ever a matter of time before something like this happened. When it came to the Earth's superheroes, they were all obsessed with their own individual goals. And that's that really kind of hits home at the nature of Marvel superheroes. Marvel superheroes in a lot of ways are grounded. They're very personal. They really focus on the nature of people. The Avengers aren't necessarily a tried and true superhero team so much as they are a group of heroes who came together for like a particular cause. But they all have their own motivations. They all have their own desires, the goals they're trying to achieve. Tony Stark is a futurist. He's always looking to the future. You've got Black Widow who's carrying all her baggage from the Red Room. You've got Mockingbird who's trying to prove she's legit. You've got Quicksilver who's just trying to get his sister back. Nobody's really looking at this and saying, we are a cohesive team. People are looking at this and saying, we're just the last vestiges of what superheroes used to be. And we're just holding out, trying to find the Cosmic Cube and then maybe we'll win. And that's really it. That's all they have. And Hydra Captain America knows that. And it's the coolest thing because what he did is he basically turned code to somebody. He made them into a spy. And all it would take is someone to realize that's the case and to say, someone here is a spy. And then that just becomes self-destruction because they're so selfish, because they're motivated by their own desires, their own goals. At the end of the day, the enemy isn't necessarily Hydra Captain America. The enemy is their inability to function as a team, to put their problems aside and focus on a common, a common enemy for any real measure of time. Now, of course, where the poking and prodding begins to go around in terms of the failings of the individual characters, who it is that's doing this, who it is that's doing that, what we also end up finding out is that this speech that's being given by Captain America is being given to Bruce Banner. Remember, Bruce Banner's back. We don't really know how. And the idea here is that Captain America hits home with the notion of the reason 
why it is that the superheroes always opposed Bruce Banner. Because remember, it wasn't necessarily the fact that Banner was the Hulk that led a lot of superheroes to turn against him. Even when he was just Banner, they didn't necessarily take him seriously. The scientific community didn't necessarily take him seriously. For the most part, when he was a superhero reaching out to Banner for advice or help on something, he was the last guy they would go to. In some cases, they would go to villains before they went to Bruce Banner. It was the total lack of trust, the total disconnect between them and how they viewed Banner. And the cool thing about this is Captain America says the reason why is because you represent an unquantifiable concept. You represent something that cannot be controlled, that cannot be contained. You represent something that people just cannot fight. You are the quintessential example of absolute pure and total chaos because that's what the Hulk is. And that's what Captain America says. The Hulk is just this uncontrollable thing, this force of nature. But the funny thing about this is that Banner's response is, but you're a Hydra agent. You are not a good guy. And that's the cool thing here is because it's not like everybody just kind of looks at this and says, yeah, well, I mean, you know, he's a Hydra agent, you know, and what can you say? I mean, that happens sometimes. You know, Banner is like the one guy who's been gone this entire time. He's just kind of resurrected or whatever the case may be. He comes to and suddenly Captain America is a Hydra agent and Hydra's taken over the country. And so where Banner initially says, okay, I can't do this. I'm not going to side with you. Captain America's response is, yeah, but I wasn't talking to you, Bruce Banner, which is when the Hulk emerges. And it is, man, it is a sight to behold. Because like we said, the Hulk is just pure conflict, just pure chaos. And that's the crazy thing, because where Scott Lang finally comes clean and says, I'm the spy for Hydra. They have my daughter, Cassie. They basically shanghaied me in and said, if you want your daughter to live, you're going to spy on Tony Stark's team. When all this information basically becomes two, the Hulk emerges. And that's the caveat to all this, because Tony Stark accounted for everything at that point in time. Bruce Banner, the Hulk, was dead. There was no reason to believe that he was going to come back. There was no reason to believe that he would be alive. Tony Stark did not account for this just incalculable, unlimited strength of a force of nature just coming down on the Avengers headquarters like the wrath of God. Nobody expected that to happen, but that's exactly what happens. The Hulk just smashes in and suddenly this entire bunker is all for naught because all it takes now are the forces of Hydra Captain America to come waltzing in. While this is happening, the incredible Hulk is recalling the events of what it is that took place during Civil War II when Hawkeye shot Bruce Banner, killed him with an arrow, when Bruce Banner felt betrayed, when Bruce Banner felt cheated. That's why the Hulk is just raging so much because all this pent up emotion, this, this feeling of betrayal, this feeling of deception, this belief that the superheroes had turned against him for no real reason whatsoever at the behest of Carol Danvers, all this is coming home to roost. And now the Incredible Hulk is letting it all out. But remember, the Incredible Hulk Hulk, as he was being resurrected, was only ever temporary. Again, we don't know why. We don't know if magic was used. We don't know if he was like resurrected by Captain America using the hand. All we know is that the Incredible Hulk was brought back for a temporary amount of time. The result of this is that in the midst of the ensuing chaos and in the midst of the conflict, Odin's son shows up, but instead of just quashing any of the civilians that are trying to get out, instead of just killing every superhero he comes across, he basically allows them to pass. Now remember, in the last video, we talked about Odin's son's loyalty. Odin's son is not loyal to Hydra Captain America. He does not believe that Hydra Captain America is doing the right thing. He is not okay with what's happening. The loyalties of Odin's son is to Mjolnir, is to the hammer. And by his logic, if Captain America can lift the hammer, Captain America is worthy. If Captain America is worthy, then Odin's son should follow him because if he wasn't worthy, if he wasn't righteous, he wouldn't be able to lift the hammer. So again, it's a pretty cool scenario. It's a pretty cool set of events. Now again, you know, kind of going through the comments of the, of the the different videos that we've talked about with regards to Thor's hammer. I mean, there are some, you know, who are just kind of like, no, 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 only good guys can lift the hammer. But like we talked about before, the cause of the hammer is not predicated on good guys. It's predicated on worth. That's just the nature of the hammer. That's just how it works. And so again, it's one of these cool things because this ultimately leads to a fight between Captain America and Iron Man himself. Now, of course, with the Incredible Hulk just kind of fading out, you know, really just more or less just dying, I guess, going back to being dead, not really sure where the case is with him. What ends up happening is totally Tony Stark almost stops Captain America dead in his tracks. And the reason why is because what he does is he apologizes. This is one of the great things about Secret Empire. It draws on everything that's happened in Marvel Comics in like the last 10 years, maybe even 15 years. Tony Stark even starts talking about the events of the first Civil War. He thought that he was right. He believed that he was doing the right thing. But when the conflict was done, when it was all said and over, you know, when the smoke cleared, it wasn't worth it. I mean, he draws on the story, the confession. For those of you guys who never read it, 
Civil War The Confession is basically event, the, uh, the story is really like a one shot that takes place directly after the events of the death of Captain America. And it's only Tony Stark and it's only Captain America. No one else is in that story unless they're in like a flashback or something like that. But what Tony Stark did in that is he basically confessed and said, it wasn't worth it. If I'd known that Civil War was going to result in your death, I never would have uh, instigated this conflict in the first place because Captain America stands for hope. He stands for the belief in a better tomorrow. And that's kind of the funny thing about this is because if you look at Captain America right now, he still does. I mean, sure, Hydra is a fascist organization, right? Like they're basically taking over the country and ruling it in an iron fist. But one of the things that we saw when this story first kicked off is that there's jobs that are increasing. The stock market's better. People aren't struggling for money. For the most part, society in and of itself is inherently better, so long as you're the right kind of citizen. And that's the difference here. That's the caveat. How much are people willing to sacrifice in order to make things better? Better. Is it one of those things where people are willing to sit down and say, yeah, man, Hydra's running the show and it kind of sucks if you're that guy. But for me, it's cool. And now what happens if that guy who says it's cool, Hydra comes knocking on his door? Is he still going to say that? Is he still going to say, no, nah, everything's fine, man. Yeah, take me away. It's cool. I don't mind. Take me off to jail. I don't have a problem with that because society is better. Of course not. The guy's going to say, well, no, 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 no. All right. I mean, you know, I'm get that guy. Don't get me. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm good. I'm fine. Everybody's okay with the status quo until the status quo shifts and then the powers that be start coming after them. What we end up finding out is that the other member is really Elisa, the one that basically brought Steve Rogers into Hydra when he was a child. And she basically ends up, or at least her forces, begin picking up some weird signal emanating from the Avengers headquarters, only for us to find out that what Tony Stark has effectively done is activated a tactical nuke and detonates it. Basically nukes the entirety of Avengers headquarters and anybody who was there. And so this is massive because anybody who didn't get out of the impact of this nuclear bomb is dead. They're gone. We don't know who those people are yet, but if they were there, they're up in smoke. And so what ends up happening here is Black Widow is listening to the events unfold and basically comes to the realization that as far as she's concerned, as far as she knows, all the Avengers are dead. They're all gone. They just poof like that in a nuclear explosion. If they weren't like Thor or somebody like that, they couldn't survive it. And so in the last little tail bit of the story, what she does is wake up the champions with the intention of traveling to Hydra headquarters and killing Captain America. My dog is probably the dumbest creature that ever lived. I swear to God, this, this dog's dumber than a box of hammers. Anyway, guys, what is up? I absolutely love my dog. What is going on, guys? For those of you guys who don't know, myself, Comic Storian, uh, and Natalie at Zatical Candy, we run a channel called Eligible Monster. Make sure you guys check that out because we did like a hide and seek custom game for Overwatch. We actually found that mode on the internet and it was really, really fun to play. It was really cool. But anyway, we are back into it with Secret Empire. And this is cool because Secret Empire is rapidly proving to be one of my absolute favorite stories when it comes to uh, the Captain America landscape and Marvel Comics at the moment. Ironically enough, it's like this and Old Man Logan are like the only two things that I'm reading. <laughs> and the Mighty Thor. I took a little bit of a break from the Mighty Thor during Secret Empire because it's literally just what Jane Foster is doing while Secret Empire is going on, which we might cover. She's just in some weird dimension, but she came back in the most recent story, so uh, it's still kind of cool. But the idea here is with Secret Empire, we are getting into basically the crescendo, which is to say the point at which which we reach the peak and then things start going down into the conclusion of the story, which you, if you are current with Secret Empire is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> remember dude that's oh my god it's one of the coolest moments the most recent one that just came out issue number nine it spills the beans on what the vanishing point is it spills the beans on everything that's going on with regards to like what's up with this classic captain america character it's god it's so cool man it's so exciting <laughs> i love secret empire anyway so what we do here we, we're really gonna do a little bit of a little bit of a catch-up thing for this this little bit of a story and it works because what this initially does is it picks up with alpha flight now again Alpha Flight is kind of this all-encompassing team, which is to say, under normal circumstances, Alpha Flight Station is just the old Canadian Alpha Flight team that was never relevant, which is now operating out of a space station and still isn't relevant, but they basically serve as this kind of monitoring force for the universe. Remember, in Marvel Comics, you have all different kinds of organizations. You have the Hand, which contrary to what the Defenders say, the Hand were never part of Kun Lun. Now, the only thing the Defenders got right about the Hand was that they operate behind the scenes, influencing governments, politicians, the whole nine yards. But the fact remains here, with uh, the different organizations that exist in Marvel, Alpha Flight basically took the place of S.W.O.R.D. Now, S.W.O.R.D. stands for the Sentient World Observation and Response Department, and they basically existed along
alongside S.H.I.E.L.D., where S.H.I.E.L.D. monitored Earth, S.W.O.R.D. monitored space. They monitored other planets, races, and so on and so forth to make sure there were no credible threats to Earth. That was the normal role they played. The reason why that's important is because all this really seems to focus on Carol Danvers in the beginning, which is to say for the first few pages or so. In this little bit of a story, Carol Danvers actually ends up just kind of speaking in terms of how she views everything and what's gone down. And that's kind of the crazy situation about this because she's currently speaking to Quasar as Quasar exists in the Marvel Universe. Now we'll talk about the power of Quasar here in a little bit because I feel like this will be a pretty cool discussion point when it comes to her character just because of the fact that we kind of have to know a little bit about Quasar in order to understand everything that's going on. That might be something we discuss in the next video because Quasar is a little more important in the next video than she is in this one. But the idea is that Carol Danvers hits back to everything that had happened going into all new, all different Marvel and even before then. And that's one of the reasons why a lot of fans who look at Marvel at the moment, they feel a little disenfranchised in terms of their attention to Marvel, the money they've paid, the readership, the whole nine yards, much in the same way that classic DC fans felt when DC rebooted with the new 52. So again, everything, you know, all this has happened before and all of this will happen again to quote Battlestar Galactica. The idea here is that Carol Danvers basically says she had always spent so much time trying to prove herself as a legitimate hero that ultimately she got carried away with her attempts to show that she knew what she was doing. And that's true to a degree. Historically speaking, up until about 2012 with the first launch of Marvel Now, Marvel Now 1.0, Carol Danvers was always a background character. She basically had two major roles in her life. The first one was basically being the vector by which Rogue gained her powers, which is to say Rogue latched on to Carol Danvers, held her for too long, and then basically copied her powers, and that's what made Rogue so powerful and so cool. The other half of this was Immortus giving birth to himself by way of Carol Danvers. Don't ask why, that story's confusing and it's stupid, but it's one of the things that ended up happening with her character. But up until 2012, she was never relevant. Now, the reason why that matters is because in 2012, because Carol Danvers' origin story basically saw her gaining the powers of the original Captain Marvel, she had always been living up to his mantle, she always idolized him. In 2012, with the original Marvel Now, Carol Danvers basically became the new Captain Marvel because that was just the role that she needed to take. Everybody said, hey, look, you've basically been taking his role for years and years and years. It's time for you to just take the name too. And so because of that, it saw her escapades going into space and it was a really, really beautiful series of stories with her character in terms of how she unfolded. The problem with this is that when all new, all different Marvel kicked off, suddenly she was a bad guy. Suddenly she was someone who was just like, we have to stop crime before it happens, you know, and all this nonsense. And it was really a total 180 from the character that we were used to. But the common thread was that in the classic stories, the way she was written, she was always trying to prove she was a legitimate hero. She was always trying to prove that, hey, look, I can hold my own. And she could. Carol Danvers was a force to be reckoned with. She was not a pushover. She had energy manipulation powers. She basically had super strength, speed, durability. She could fly. She was like a female version of Superman who could shoot energy. It was really, really cool. But the goal here is she's basically simply saying everything that's transpired has happened because of her. During the Civil War II storyline with the whole idea of Ulysses being able to see the future, she started engineering circumstances, the creation of a shield to protect the world, arresting people for committing crimes before they happen, different things like that. In doing so, she had literally split the superhuman community in half. She had, you know, ushered in the second civil war. And the result is that Captain America as a Hydra agent used that rift in the superhero community to navigate those waters to chart that course and catapult himself to the top by conquering the United States and allowing Hydra to reign supreme. So in a lot of ways, everything that's happened with Secret Empire is Carol Danvers' fault. Now that begs the question, is it possible things could have turned out a different way? Well, I mean, sure, it's comic books. You could write them any number of ways. But the idea is that in terms of just what goes on here, this most likely would have happened anyway, because the superhero community in Marvel Comics has always been fractured. The Avengers are always fighting against some enemy somewhere, but there's always a lot of infighting. And so it was only a matter of time before something like this happened. Now, the other half of this is that this also follows Black Widow, because remember, Natasha Romanoff, following the events of the last video that we talked about, where the Incredible Hulk was just unleashed before his death, and he basically destroyed the entirety of the Avengers bunker and left them open to attack from Hydra, Black Widow had basically looked at this and said, Captain America needs to die. But the reason why this is cool is because this all goes back to Civil War II. Remember, the great big huge revelation that came out of Civil War II is that Miles Morales Spider-Man is supposed to kill Captain America. And that's really Miles' biggest fear. Keep in mind, for those of you guys who are new, Miles Morales was originally Spider-Man from the Ultimate Universe, which is to say, kind of a more updated, contemporary retelling of superheroes for really the new generation. But when Secret Wars happened, happened when the collapse of the multiverse took place, Miles Morales was rolled into the main Marvel universe and then just kind of operated as
as his own superhero. But during the events of Civil War II, Ulysses forced all the superheroes to see a future where the United States was in an almost complete and total disarray, where the Capitol building was just torn all asunder, and amidst it all, Miles Morales looked like he had basically killed Captain America. And so what ends up happening here is that where Miles is part of the champions, and Miles has come with Black Widow for the purpose of keeping an eye on her and trying to assuage her from killing Captain America, we also end up finding that he's basically trapped. She literally confines him within the ship. And the reason why is because she says, look, Captain America is going to die. But if he's going to die, he's going to die at my hands. My hands are going to be the ones that are sullied. And that's kind of the cool thing here. That's why Natasha Romanoff is always a little interesting. There's always something about her that usually takes the reader by surprise because she is a cold-blooded, dyed-in-the-wool killer. That's all she does. She's just one of the best assassins in the world. But for Miles Morales, he's still young. He's unsullied by the mark of death, more or less. He's unsullied by all these different things that could basically turn him into a bad guy. The goal of Natasha Romanoff is to make sure that innocence stays. Now, this whole idea is basically coming by way of Captain America on the Capitol grounds making a speech. And the goal here is to basically bring in members of Congress because Congress is still intact and simply say, you guys support what Hydra is doing don't you? Now, this is kind of the cool thing because when it comes to like ruling a country or conquering a country, people will usually only ever fight back. They'll usually only ever revolt when they feel like they have no other choice. But as long as there's food on their table, as long as there's clothes on their backs and the backs of their children, as long as there's a roof over their head and the head of their children, they have no reason to fight. They're not backed up against the wall. And that's what you do in a situation like this. You let people continue to use the internet. You censor it, you regulate it, but you let it leak out that there's these dark spots that you can't see, these little sections where you just can't monitor. You can, but you let people believe that you can't. They congregate in those small areas and you weed them out. You set up traps. And so ultimately, they're just a dog chasing its tail. And that's the beauty of Captain America's Hydra. He's leading the people to believe that there is actual progress going on. He's leading the people to believe they actually have a chance to revolt. The funny thing about this is that that belief will become absolute truth. And the reason why is because we actually end up finding out that the old man who's basically confined in this bed. The old man that we had talked about in previous videos, this old man is basically housing Mosaic. Now, Mosaic is an inhuman who basically has the ability to possess people. He's introduced or really kind of brought in as a character that can turn the tide. And the reason why is because what Natasha Romanoff needs is a distraction. Firing off a shot into Hydra and killing Captain America would inevitably, you know, that would result in him being gone, but she would end up being captured, probably tortured, and then eventually killed. The goal is to take out Captain America and then become part of the rebuilding process. And so what ends up happening here is that with Mosaic basically jumping from Hydra agent to Hydra agent, creating this sort of turmoil and chaos, possessing this guy, uh, these guys, forcing them to kill each other, what it does is it creates mass pandemonium and mass chaos. And with this chaos happening, the goal of Natasha Romanoff is to shoot Captain America. The problem with this is that while she's in the middle of doing that, she suddenly met with the arrival of the Punisher. And that's what makes this so cool. Because remember, the Punisher joined Hydra. Now, we didn't initially know why. We weren't really told why this was the case. All we knew is that the Punisher allied himself with Captain America. Now, the explanation that's given to us is that Captain America had basically given Punisher an out. He had gone to Frank Castle and said, hey, look, you've been waging this war against crime your entire life. You've been killing criminals after they've committed a crime. What if I told you I would give you an army? I would give you the means to go through and kill every single criminal that exists. What would you say to that? Frank Castle's answer is absolutely yes. And that fits perfectly in line with Frank Castle because the idea is that for Frank Castle, all he wants to do is kill criminals. But when he's given the, given the option, to go through and just achieve his goal in the extreme, why would he turn that down? It'd be absolutely foolish to do so. And so, you know, at the behest of Captain America, he seeks out Natasha Romanoff and ends up beating the absolute hell out of her. Now, one thing to keep in mind is that in a lot of ways, this normally shouldn't happen. Frank Castle is a great fighter. He's a special agent. He's been trained in all kinds of different martial arts and weapons use and so on and so forth, but he's no Black Widow. If it came down to it under any normal circumstance, Black Widow would beat the hell out of him. That's really Really not up for debate. Frank Castle couldn't really hold his own against Natasha Romanoff for any me uh, any measure of time. This just kind of gives us a different take on the scenario. So again, it's a little bit out of character for these two guys, but Natasha Romanoff ultimately makes her escape. And the reason why is because she notices that Miles Morales is going to find Captain America. But with her basically bailing out, this begins to bring into fruition the idea of what it is that Captain America has been doing and the idea that Miles Morales is going to take him out. Now keep in mind, everybody saw 
saw that prediction of Ulysses, including Steve Rogers himself. The difference here is that when Steve Rogers saw that prediction, he realized that Hydra had won in that future. And so it didn't matter to him if Miles Morales killed him because the goal of Hydra would continue on. Hydra would rule the country and eventually the world. And so in his mind, sacrificing his life is a small price to pay to ensure the dream of Hydra's rule continues to live on. The problem with this is that when Natasha Romanoff goes to intervene in an attempt to stop Miles Morales from potentially killing Captain America, Captain America breaks her neck with a shield. Now this is huge because Natasha Romanoff is one of the few characters and I'm pretty I'm pretty sure I'm accurate when I say this she's one of the few characters in Marvel Comics who's never died there's never been an instance that I know of where Natasha Romanoff has been killed not only that this sets off the attack from Miles Morales. And this is when we start to get that big picture. Because remember, when Ulysses originally gave everybody the glimpse into the future that saw Miles Morales killing Captain America, it was just that. It was tantamount to taking a photograph and then saying, here's what the future looks like. Sure, you get that one moment in time, but you don't get the full circumstance. You don't get the full explanation of what it was that was happening. Now, what we end up finding out is that this is the reason why the Captain America was a Hydra agent, had conquered America, had killed Black Widow along with a multitude of other superheroes and Miles Morales had just had enough. Now in this moment when he's getting ready to kill Steve Rogers, when Steve Rogers is going to die, he's convinced by the daughter of Hank Pym and Janet Van Dyne not to do this. And so again, that's where the tide begins to change. Now again, this all goes back into Ulysses because we didn't know what happened after. We just got this quick moment. Ulysses is like, look what's going to happen with the superhero community. Miles Morales is going to kill Captain America. And everybody was like, my God. And then that's it. That's all we get. We didn't get the aftermath. It's entirely possible this was exactly what was going to happen. It's also possible that because this glimpse was given to everybody, this is what happened. That had that glimpse not happened from Ulysses, that Miles Morales would have just killed Captain America and that would have been it. No muss, no fuss. Hydra was basically defeated. And that's the kind of funny thing about this is because Hydra itself may have engineered its own destruction. And so the result is that following the attempted, you know, killing of uh, Captain America by Miles Morales, of course, Miles is basically, uh, basically captured. And so ultimately we end up having Sharon Carter brought before Captain America. Now remember, Sharon Carter is a character who for quite some time has not seen herself as an ally of, of Steve Rogers. Once he came out and declared himself as a Hydra agent, she basically walked away. She said, I'm not having anything to do with this. But for the most part, she's been kept a, as a prisoner under the guise that Captain America can basically bring her over to his side. Now, Sharon Carter is not particularly important. It's really just an emotional thing because the two of them were together for quite some time. They were love interests. They were meant to be a thing. But in this moment when Captain America shows weakness, Sharon Carter tried to kill him. Now this is huge because this is a throwback to the original death of Captain America story. In the original event following Civil War and you know going into Avengers the initiative I think it was and then eventually the death of Steve Rogers what we had learned in that particular story way back in 2007, 2008, 2009 something along those lines is that uh, the Red Skull had basically brought in a guy named Dr. Faustus who had the ability to hypnotize people into committing acts. Sharon Carter was basically the killing blow. The way that original event unfolded is that Crossbones was a distraction. Crossbones fired a shot into Steve Rogers' shoulder. Sharon Carter ran to his aid, and then she fired a couple shots into his stomach and his chest, and that was the end of Captain America. Almost immediately after that happened, we learned that Dr. Faustus was the one that had been brainwashing her into doing that in the first place. But again, this all goes back to that idea. The difference here is that Sharon Carter is not killing him because she's brainwashed. She's trying to kill him because she just genuinely hates him. And so this is really Nick Spencer saying, Captain America's crossed the line that he can't come back from. If the one person that he should be able to confide in the most absolutely tries to kill him because she despises him, he's long gone. There's no way to redeem him. And so what this seems to indicate here is that when this story ends, it will not come by way of Hydra Captain America waking up and realizing his mistakes and saying, my God, what have I done? It'll be something else going on. That something is explained in <laughs> Secret Empire issue number nine. <laughs> I really hope you guys are current. But the idea here, we actually end up picking up with this classic Captain America and the Red Skull. Now, the funny thing about this is that Red Skull tries to kill classic Captain America, but it doesn't look like he's trying to do this because he's a bad guy. Instead, classic Captain America gets a glimpse of this woman who's shrouded in light and then is able to overcome the Red Skull. But what seemed to have happened here is Red Skull intended to kill classic Captain America to save him. But the idea is that classic Captain America basically overcame the Red Skull and literally literally destroyed his own way to escape the vanishing point. And so that's kind of the crazy thing here is because the question is one, who's this chick? And two, 
what is the vanishing point? Now, of course, back in the aftermath of the death of Natasha Romanoff, everybody's basically struggling with this in a multitude of different ways. Really, none more so than Hawkeye. Because remember, Hawkeye and Black Widow go back quite some ways. They both basically appeared around the same time. Over the course of their publication histories, they became good guys and ultimately joined the Avengers. But their histories go hand in hand to say nothing of the romance between the two of them. So the whole idea here is that there's an, there's an effort by the various superhero community to try to find a way to rally. The problem with this is that the champions and Miles Morales, they've been captured. Natasha Romanoff is dead. The bodies of the superhero community just keep piling up and piling up and piling up. They're fighting a losing war. There's really no way that they can come out on top here. And so ultimately, in the midst of this idea, when all hope is effectively lost, Sam Wilson, one of my absolute favorite characters ever, <laughs> finally returns to the mantle of Captain America, which I am so hyped to see what happens next. <laughs> this is why I love Secret Empire so much. I love Sam Wilson, Captain America. God, it's one of my absolute favorite stories, one of my favorite, favorite roles for his character. Okay, while I can't necessarily release the Secret Empire videos until Friday, just because of the fact that we have to maintain our schedule, it does not keep me from recording them a week ahead. <laughs> because <laughs> man do I love this story it's the only way I know how to work out my excitement for for Secret Empire but in the last videos what, what we've talked about so far because we're approaching the end like we've got maybe three more videos left and then Secret Empire is done which I'm going to be so disappointed in because this, this story is so good but what we've talked about so far is that Secret Empire for the most part has basically played out in three phases so the first phase dealt with the idea of Hydra Captain America basically using Civil War 2 as a way to implement his own rule in the sense that that the superhero community basically waged war against one another in the sense that you had uh, an inhuman named Ulysses who could see the future. Because of the fact that he could see the future, the superhero community split in half. Now, over the course of Civil War II, there were times where his visions were a little off. They weren't 100% true, but for the most part, they seemed to be. Now, as a result of these visions, Bruce Banner, the Incredible Hulk was killed. Different events took place that ultimately led to this fractured superhero community. In light of that, Captain America, as a Hydra agent, began doing things things like implementing the erection of a shield around the planet that would basically stave off attacks from all but the most powerful beings in existence. And so because of this, this set the stage for him to basically conquer the entirety of the United States with the intention of turning his sights onto the rest of the world and then eventually the universe itself. Now the way in which he was going to conquer the universe came by way of the Cosmic Cube. The problem with this was that the Cosmic Cube had become sentient in the form of a girl named Kavik. And the idea was that after being taken by the Red Skull and indoctrinated by Hydra's ideologies, Kabak, at the request of Red Skull, had basically changed the history of Captain America Steve Rogers, making him a Hydra agent in the first place. The result of this was that one of Captain America's agents, uh, really a guy named Eric Selvig, who was kind of the scientist working behind the scenes to help uh, Captain America, basically fractured the Cosmic Cube. And so what this did is it sent the remainder of the superhero community on a mission to try to capture what shards were left of the Cosmic Cube, while Captain America tried to do the same thing. The problem with this was that Captain America was a lot more influential just because of the fact that he was using fear and using the threat of death in order to get people to hand over their shards of the Cosmic Cube, whereas the Avengers were relying on diplomacy. The result was that we basically get up to this moment right now where what's left of the superhero community is coming together under the leadership of Captain America Sam Wilson. Now, the other half of this is that it deals with the city of New York. Now, the city of New York had basically experienced being thrown into a place called the Dark Dimension or the Dimension of Dark or whatever you want to call it. And it was done by a guy by the name of Blackout, who quite literally was able to just kind of enshroud the entire city of New York. Now within New York, you also had like Kingpin, you had Daredevil, but really the only true means for their escape would come by way of Doctor Strange, who would attempt to use his magic in order to help them achieve this goal. The problem with this was that it wasn't something easily done. Instead, it was basically Doctor Strange using whatever magics he could to no avail. And so the idea here is that under the speech basically of Sam Wilson, who would vacated his role as Captain America following Steve Rogers basically taking over the United States and then essentially coming back, the world superheroes basically have a rallying point. And that's the coolest thing about this is because as Captain America, Captain America was always a rallying point. It was always designed to be that way. And so because of this, dealing with what's left of the superhero community and Sam Wilson racing off as best he can to try to help, you know, quell this threat, the various superheroes facing off against uh, the Hydra agents in an attempt to take their country back, so to speak, what this does is it 
basically leads into everything that's been going on with Carol Danvers as, as well as the entire uh, Alpha Flight Station. Now, the cool thing about this is that, again, this bounces around from location to location. But with Doctor Strange, remember, he's been going to all these different beings that in some form or fashion tie into magics and mysticism. It's one of the other reasons why New York being whisked away, you know, with Dark Force energy really helped Nick Spencer kind of give himself a way out of the story in terms of Doctor Strange himself, or at least offer the possibility. Because remember, just because of the fact that they're in a different dimension doesn't mean that Doctor Strange is any less powerful than he was before. The issue is, can they escape? And that's the nature of it. Doc Doctor Strange going around grabbing every single spell that he can muster is an attempt to basically escape this realm. But he's got his books, he's got all these different things, but he just can't pull it off because in truth, the Dark Force energy is just far too extreme and he's just not powerful enough to do it on his own. Now remember, a lot of this also comes out of the Jason Aaron Doctor Strange solo series, which is to say, during that story, we dealt with the idea that all magic in existence was basically being destroyed. And that's why all this works. It's not as though Nick Spencer came along and said, we're going to depower Doctor Strange strictly for this story. Instead, it tied directly into his own story itself in terms of what was going on with his character. With magic basically being obliterated, the source of Doctor Strange's power began to go away. Now, as the enemies of, I can't remember what their names were, but as those enemies who were destroying magic were basically defeated and magic began to grow, it was like a tree, right? Like if you go out into a field and you plant the seedling, hoping it'll grow into a tree and you provide some water and you allow sunlight to hit it, you're not going to come out the next morning with a full blown redwood tree. You're going to have to wait years, decades in order for it to grow to its full potential. Now, in the case of magic, it wouldn't take hundreds of years for it to all return, but it does take time. And that's the reason why Doctor Strange is not as powerful as he was before, because the source, the, the energy he uses, or the magic he uses is not where it used to be. And so that's really the nature of his character, the evolution of Doctor Strange in terms of what it is that he can and can't do. The problem with this is that while they're trying to cast these spells, try as they might, they cannot get out. They cannot get away. And so that's the craziest thing about this. At the same time, we also have the Guardians of the Galaxy. Now remember, with Alpha Flight, with the forces of, of Carol Danvers and Hyperion, and all these beings who could easily bring Hydra crashing down to the ground, they're all stranded outside the Earth, and they're totally incapable of penetrating the shield. Now the attempt to get past it comes by way of Rocket Raccoon. And it's really cool because Rocket Raccoon literally shows up and says, hey, there's this massive bomb that we have that we literally stole from another race. We're hoping that we can basically put this bomb inside of uh, the Alpha Flight Station and then crash it into the shield, hoping to blow it up. In the end, none of it works. The shield is just as impervious as it ever was. And that's kind of crazy because while all this is going on, there's things like Doctor Strange cannot get them out of the Dark Force dimension. Captain America, Sam Wilson, in his efforts to basically take out the shield agents, is basically knocked down into the ocean and is presumed to be dead. It's almost like this glimpse of success popped up for their superheroes. And almost when they thought they had a chance to win, they didn't. But their one hope comes in the form of of Quasar. If you're not familiar with the Quasar character, it's easily somebody to write off. And that's usually one of the things that you hear. People who don't know about Quasar, people who just kind of read articles or whatever, like whatever, it's Quasar, Quasar's stupid. It's actually not true. In Fantastic Four Volume 1, issue number 552, Quasar fought Galactus to a standstill. Like Galactus was just literally trying to kill the Fantastic Four, Quasar jumped in and was blocking every single attack that Galactus threw out, which I think Galactus was in a hungered state, which is when he's as ravenous and more dangerous than he normally is. So in his worst form, Quasar held off against Galactus. And that's one of the things about the character. It's one of the reasons why Quasar is usually just kind of looked over and just kind of ignored, when in reality, Quasar is insanely powerful. Now, one other thing to keep in mind is that Quasar was Wendell Vaughn. This is a new Quasar, but the power is still the exact same. It's a matter of how you use it. They're given these quantum bands, which allows them to tap into an infinite source of energy and then in turn, use those bands however they want to. The question is, how far will their imagination take them. In this instance, with Quasar coming back, it's almost like Galactus showing up and just ending everything. Quasar blasts the shield with enough energy to totally destroy it. This is universal level power. And so that's why it's so cool is because again, this is not Nick Spencer just beefing up the powers of a character and saying, oh man, I need a way out. We're going to amp up the powers of Quasar. We're going to make Quasar more powerful than they've ever been just for the sake of achieving this goal. That power has always been there. Quasar has always been that powerful. It's just how is that power written by any 
particular writer. And so again, with this scenario, with the shield being totally and, and completely obliterated by Quasar, what it does is it leaves the, the landscape open for those members of Alpha Flight to come flying back down to Earth, which means the ultimate Blue Marvel, one of the most powerful beings in existence, Spectrum, who can basically become any form of energy, Hyperion, all these characters just come flooding back into Earth, and now the landscape is effectively even. The stage is set for the fall of Hydra. And so what happens is we end up picking up with Maria Hill. Now remember, if you haven't been keeping up with Secret Empire, Maria Hill was very Nick Fury-esque in the sense of how her character played out. If you're familiar with, with Marvel, bear with me for a second. Classic Nick Fury, which is to say the white guy Nick Fury, uh, that version of his character always had safeguards, always had bunkers. He always had these, these situations in place so that if everything went to pot, there was some place he could retreat to and then try to defeat whatever that enemy was. But the fact remains that in this instance, Maria Hill following the rise of Captain America Steve Rogers conquering the entirety of the United States went underground. And what she did is she became an information broker for the various renegade superheroes out there who were trying to find ways to topple Captain America the Hydra agent. All she did was slip them information, whatever information she could get. Now, of course, that information came from various sources she had who had been captured by Hydra in the sense that they were former S.H.I.E.L.D. agents, former superheroes. They would pass information on to her for the greater good, which in turn, she would pass on to Iron Man and his forces. Now, what this does is it brings the role of Maria Hill into sharp relief in the sense that she basically finds uh, Blackout. Now, of course, Blackout being the person that basically grabbed New York and threw it in the Dark Force Energy is the only guy who can basically bring it out. The problem with this is that his allegiances are still a little off. The idea is that with him working alongside Captain America, he didn't know where this would lead to. And so the result is that once Captain America used the powers of Blackout and then took over the country, Blackout had regrets. Blackout wasn't sure that he had done the right thing. But the problem is that Blackout was never an A-list villain. He was never Kingpin. He was never Dr. Octopus. He was never, you know, any of these characters who's just like, I know what I stand for. I know exactly what I believe. He was a guy that at the first sign of danger would run for the hills. And so it was easier for him to basically pretend to continue being an ally of Hydra. And so in the face of all this, Maria Hill does the only thing she can do. She shoots him in the back of the head and kills him. And in doing so, the spell is broken. New York is free out to the world, which in turn brings all of New York's superheroes into the fray. It starts bringing in Doctor Strange, Iron Fist, Power Man, Cloak and Dagger. All these superheroes, no matter how popular, no matter how minor, are all now returning. And so again, this basically continues to set the stage for the defeat of Hydra. And so what happens here is that in this moment, we also remember have to deal with the Chitauri. Now, for those of you guys who don't know, who haven't been keeping up, that was the way in which Hydra Captain America constantly kept Alpha Flight on edge. It was one thing for them to be stuck out the planet Earth because of the huge shield. But what Hydra Captain America had done is he has also gone to this Chitauri race, stolen one of their queens, and brought them back to Earth. And then for that reason, the Chitauri were constantly trying to invade the Earth, you know, crashing themselves on the shield. And Alpha Flight was constantly trying to stop the Chitauri army. The result is that the Chitauri were basically continuing to go against Alpha Flight. It was battling 24 hours a day, day after day, and they would just send wave after wave after wave after wave, which would increase in number with each wave. And so again, it was just hordes just bombarding on Earth. Now, one could ask the question, why didn't Alpha Flight just stand out of the way and just let the Chitauri just keep invading Earth, you know, just keep smashing into the shield? Well, the issue with that is they didn't know how well the shield would sustain. They're protectors of Earth. Despite the fact that they're cast out from the planet, they exist to keep it safe. At the same time, it was also a way to draw a little bit of little bit of tension in the story. It was a way for Nick Spencer to just say, oh man, look at, look at how exhausted they are. Look at how worn out they are, you know, that kind of thing. Now, with the Earth superheroes basically returning with Black Panther in Wakanda for example, having been captured, for the most part, everybody else staves off as best they can. They defeat every single one of these Hydra agents, or at least attempt to, as best they can. So what this does is it's leading into a crescendo. It's leading into this final moment, this final push, when everything that Hydra built is going to come crashing down. But the question also has to be asked, what about classic Captain America. One of the biggest questions that I've been seeing down in the comments section is, what is this vanishing point? Again, for those of you guys who are not keeping up with Secret Empire, what we've gotten at, well, at least we got it at the end of like the second or third issue, and then we've gotten it interspersed in the different stories so far, is some place that we only know as the vanishing point. And within this vanishing point is classic Captain America, which is to say Steve Rogers before he was revealed to be a Hydra agent. Classic Steve Rogers. So the good guy. The issue is we didn't know what this was. We had no clue 
clue what this place was. All we knew is that this was a guy just wandering around, but we had no clue what in the world was going on. He's had little glimpses where he's basically recalled his own history, his origin story, being a byproduct of the super soldier program, fighting against the Nazis during World War II, Bucky Barnes dying against the drone plane, all these different things, this intact history that we know so well, all of this is basically coming out of this vanishing point. And so in this moment, when he sees what seems to be Sharon Carter, this sort of ghostly apparition, when he calls out to her, when she basically vanishes, what we're told is that everyone's gone. Everybody that Steve Rogers had met up to this point in the vanishing point is gone. They're not there anymore. And the reason why is because this vanishing point basically seems to be the cosmic cube, that this vanishing point is Kabik herself, that she's the one that made all this stuff the way it is, which begs the question, how does this reconcile these two Captain Americas? How does it reconcile the Hydra Captain America in the real world and this classic Captain America in this vanishing point, presumably inside the cosmic cube? And I can tell you right now, the next video that we do <laughs> will answer that. Man, it'll answer all your burning questions. Uh, it will... <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty awesome. It's pretty exciting. Ah, uh, man. Because, like, after the next issue, I looked at that and I was like, well, I know exactly how this story is going to end. And, uh, and it's going to be amazing. Members of the Rob Corps. Man. I am so sad that Secret Empire is coming to an end. I've loved this story so far. It's, it's, it's so cool. I mean, I've been reading comics since like 1994, 1995, something like that, maybe a little bit earlier. So it's all just kind of a give and take. I mean, everybody who was reading this knew that like the original Captain America was going to come back, but it's kind of a cool thing with this whole Secret Empire story, because this is to me, one of the greatest stories involving Captain America an evil Captain America. It's always something that I thought was interesting because it's something that we've never really seen before when it came to Captain America's character on the whole, he was usually always the good guy. He was like Superman, right? Like with the exception of Injustice, you never really saw an evil Superman. With Captain America, it's much the same way. He was always the good guy. His personality was switched from time to time, but that was about it. It was always like a one-off or something along those lines or someone impersonating Captain America. So that's why this is so cool. But in the last video, we had talked about how the fall of Hydra was basically beginning, about how there were a litany of things that were all taking place all at the same time. The character Quasar, who had previously been in incapacitated at the start of Secret Empire had been left unconscious the entire time. We had talked about how in Fantastic Four, Volume 1, Issue Number 522, Quasar was able to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Galactus. And so because of that, Nick Spencer, drawing on all that storytelling from Marvel, basically established Quasar as the one character who could take down the shield, this massive force field that had surrounded Earth and kept some of the most powerful superheroes outside Earth and forced them to basically fight against this horde of Tatari army, you know, over and over and over again. But the idea was that with Quasar, effectively channeling this brief glimpse of the power of Galactus through the quantum bands, it resulted in the shield being taken down. This resulted in the various superheroes who were stranded outside of Earth, Carol Danvers, Hyperion. These characters just came flowing back in and they were able to help turn the tide of battle. Now, the other thing we had talked about is something called the vanishing point. And the vanishing point was very much this obscure thing that we didn't really know anything about. All we knew is that there was a guy who was running around there saying that he was Steve Rogers. And by all standards of measurement, he was the classic Steve Steve Rogers, which is to say the version of Captain America that we saw before the events of Secret Empire, before he was turned into a Hydra agent during Avengers standoff. During this time, we also ended up finding out that Kabik, this sentient cosmic cube, was present as well. And so what this does is answer that question. So for those of you guys who feel a little confused about what's taking place with this whole vanishing point thing, this will answer all of that. Essentially, with Steve Rogers following Kabik down this, you know, rabbit hole, so to speak, effectively what this is, is a huge explanation on what the vanishing point is itself. In truth, the vanishing point is just a place created by the cosmic cube Kabik and simply houses memories. That's all it is. This version of Steve Rogers is a memory of who Captain America used to be as opposed to who he is now. And that makes sense because remember, Kabik's a little kid and like every little kid, Kabik sees the world through idealized eyes, which is to say, here's how I would like the world to be, not the way the world is. But the idea here is that with Kabik as a character, when she looked to Captain America and when the Red Skull had basically asked her to change the history of Captain America and to make him into a Hydra agent, she did so through the eyes of a child believing that she was genuinely making the world a better place. The problem with this is that when her essence was quote unquote fragmented and scattered throughout the world, her mind remained and watching the events unfold, watching the whole of Secret Empire take place, she had basically come to the realization that she believed she made a mistake. But with regards to the remainder of the Earth superheroes, remember under the rallying point of Sam Wilson, who had returned to his mantle as Captain 
Captain America following the events of Secret Empire, basically the time where he quit. This gave the superheroes a rallying point. Because of this, it coincides with the capture of T'Challa. Now keep in mind, with Black Panther ruling over Wakanda, historically speaking in Marvel Comics, Wakanda has always been isolated. And this has been just as much a position of Black Panther in order to maintain his resources as it is the traditional role of the Black Panther lineage. Remember, when it comes to the origin of the whole Black Panther clan, the idea was that this giant meteor containing vibranium just crash landed in Wakanda. The result is that Bashinga, who I believe was the original Black Panther, basically prayed to the Panther God Bast in order to protect the mound. The Panther God Bast gave them the abilities to do it. In turn, Wakanda was built around what's known as the Great Mound, or this giant store of vibranium. And every single Black Panther that's ever existed has served the purpose of making sure that the Great Mound is always protected. With T'Challa and with T'Challa's father, they looked at it as a measure of resources. If vibranium is one of the most important metals in existence, people will pay a massive amount of money for it. And so this became as much of a tool to bolster the various resources of Wakanda, making it the most technologically advanced country in the world. This is how all that worked. But because of all that, Black Panther has routinely been isolated. And so during the events of Secret Empire, when the Cosmic Cube fragmented and just split all across the world, Black Panther gained one of the shards. But instead of just immediately running to Captain America and saying, ha ha, look what I have, you'll never get it. Instead, he just stayed in Wakanda. And Captain America sent force after force after force to try to capture the Cosmic Cube shard from Black Panther himself, and none of it was ever successful. The result is that ultimately it took Baron Zemo, Captain America's second in command, with an army far larger than the Wakandans could possibly withstand to finally invade the territory, take the Cosmic Cube fragment, and bring Black Panther in as a prisoner. And so that's where all this basically begins to come into play. Now, the other half of this are the mutants. And that's why a lot of these tie-ins were really kind of important. When it came to Secret Empire, the mutants were by and large just out there by themselves. They were in a realm called Nutian. And there was basically a treaty of sorts that was struck between Hydra and the X-Men themselves. Now, the funny thing about this is that this actually ties into the Captain America uh, tie-in for Secret Empire itself. And it's actually a cool scenario because what it does is it deals with the character of Sally Floyd. Now, of course, Sally Floyd is most notable as being a really finding her claim to fame in the Civil War frontline stories, but she was basically a reporter that at the end of it all sat down and asked Captain America, you were talking about fighting on behalf of freedom and you willingly sacrifice other superheroes' lives. And once it was all said and done, we're right back where we were before. So what progress did you really make? And so because of all that, because those hard hitting, hard line questions were being asked, ultimately Sally Floyd kind of gained a reputation as being a person that asks the wrong kind of questions to the wrong kinds of people. Now, as a journalist, that's fine because her goal was to uncover the absolute truth. But in the Captain America tie-in, she was told, do not ask about the destruction of Las Vegas. She instead chose to do that. And of course, as I've always said, you have the right to say anything you want to, and you also have the right to deal with the consequences of it. The result is that Sally Floyd was thrown in prison. Now, during this whole questioning process, she had basically asked about the X-Men, about the idea that the X-Men are receiving preferential treatment. Now, the official answer of Captain America as head of Hydra was that, well, no, the X-Men are kind of out there. We view them just like anybody else. They exist within the continental United States, and so they are under Hydra's rule. The truth was that he had struck a back alley deal with Magneto, basically saying, hey, look, you stay away, I stay away, and we're all going to be fine. Now, this makes perfect sense just because it's the X-Men. They're some of the most powerful beings in existence. Emma Frost, by herself, could probably take out Captain America and all of his Hydra forces. All these members of the X-Men could easily band together and take on Captain America to say nothing of Magneto. And that's the importance of all this. While all these superheroes are out fighting, while Spider-Man had successfully dealt with the new superior Spider-Man with the return of Dr. Octopus, this ultimately reveals the idea that Captain America in his treaty with Magneto had basically expected the X-Men to hand over the Shard of the Cosmic Cube if they ever came into possession of it. The fact that they didn't put Captain America in a situation where he basically said, you are now an enemy of Hydra. Now, the funny thing about this is that he says, hey, look, I'm willing to let bygones do bygones if you give me the Shard of the Cosmic Cube. The result is that the X-Men were biding their time. They were just waiting for the chance to strike. And that's the importance of all this is because the X-Men have always been viewed as outliers. The result is that when the X-Men have the opportunity to basically fight alongside all these other, other superheroes and essentially say, hey, look, we're not as much of an outlier as you think we are, they jump on that opportunity. The result is that while Emma Frost was basically dealing with this whole thing with Captain America, she served as a distraction. The reason why is because Captain America is floating around in a giant ship. And that giant ship is made of metal and Magneto 
controls metal. And with the force of God, he brings the whole thing crashing down. Also keep in mind here, we have Odin's son. With the Jason Aaron run of Thor, Odin's son was unable to, to wield his hammer because he didn't believe that he was worthy of wielding his hammer. Case in point, a lot of people talk about the struggles, the trials and tribulations that Odin's son went through to be able to lift his hammer. He went through all these things, these, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of years of, you know, trials and tests and so on and so forth. In a 12 issue limited story that was published in 2006, 2007, it was after the events of Thor Ragnarok that detailed the origin story of how Thor was basically able to wield his hammer in the first place. Remember, how it was that Thor became worthy was never explored in Marvel Comics. All we knew is that he had been sent to Earth and forced into the body of Donald Blake in order to experience humbleness so he would wield his hammer as a hero as opposed to this bloodlusted warrior who just wanted to get in fights all the time, like a child, effectively. The result was that he gained some measure of humbleness, he went back to wielding his hammer again, and that was it. That was his origin story and it happened in one comic. In the 12 issue limited series, that revealed that he originally became worthy because Odin sent Loki and Sif and Odin's son on a mission to fight a dragon. They succeeded and he picked up his hammer. Now, of course, with this in mind, because Odin's son's loyalty is to the side of good, at the end, he abandons the whole idea that he doesn't believe he's worthy to wield his hammer and instead literally turns against all the forces of Hydra. The result of this is that he helps to turn the tide. Now, at the same time, we get a little bit of humor in this story. With the champions, remember, they're teenagers. <laughs> That's really all they are. And at the end of the day, they were basically being held prisoner by Taskmaster and Black Ant. Now, these guys were never really important. They were basically the comedic relief for the entire Secret Empire event, which was kind of interesting. But the idea is that with the tide being turned, with Thor, you know, they, they make this comment about, oh man, did you hear that boom? It's like, yep, that's the we're gonna lose boom. And so of course they turn code on Hydra and they basically tell the champions, hey, look guys, when the Avengers come, make sure they know that we let you watch TV and that we got you milkshakes <laughs> after you cleaned your bunks. Now, when I was reading that, I couldn't help but think that like Taskmaster and Black Ant were like, hey, look guys, you gotta clean your bunks. I'll tell you what, if you clean them, we'll take you to Shake Shack or we'll get you stuff from there. And the, and the champions are like, yeah, man, I really hope that's how the whole event played out. But regardless, of course, the champions are basically released by Taskmaster and Black Ant, which bolsters the existing ranks of the superheroes fighting against Hydra. And that's basically what this is. That's why in so many ways and so many times I've said, this is what Civil War II should have been. There's motivation, there's drive, there's logic and reason behind why it is the superhero community is fighting one another. In Civil War II, it was just, well, this inhuman and says you can see the future, so we're just gonna take it as an absolute truth. Why? Well, because a movie's coming out soon and we gotta have a story called Civil War. The idea with, with Secret Empire is they're fighting against what they believe to be an oppressive regime. The idea that Hydra Captain America says he's gonna change the world, when in reality, they see that he's making it worse. Now, the question has to be asked here, how many lives are being lost in this battle? How many buildings are being destroyed? How many people are losing their homes, losing their belongings, all their personal things? Do the ends justify the means? The idea is that, again, this is really more of just setting the stage for this final battle in the sense that Doctor Strange basically brings back Jane Foster Thor because remember, in the, the free comic book day issue of Secret Empire, one of the things that Cthone, who was possessing the body of Scarlet Witch, did was banish Jane Foster Thor to another dimension. Another thing that goes on here is the idea that when it comes to Sharon Carter, she's continually being brainwashed by Dr. Faustus. That's why these little tidbits, that's why these little things are so cool. Remember, when it came to Sharon Carter, she was a long long time love interest of Captain America. But when he revealed himself to be a Hydra agent, she basically ran off. She was like, okay, look, you are not the person that I love. Don't want to have anything to do with you. But it's not like Nick Spencer sat down and said, you know what would be cool is if a guy named Dr. Faustus, who is really good at brainwashing people, brainwashed Sharon Carter just for the sake of the story. This all goes back to Civil War. During that whole thing that dealt with that original Civil War story, the whole thing that dealt with the first death of Captain America, Sharon Carter was the one who who pulled the trigger. What we ended up learning was that the Red Skull had wanted to simply eliminate Captain America and the whole Civil War event allowed for him to operate under the current because all the superheroes were distracted with their own inner conflicts. The result is that he basically grabbed Dr. Faustus and then brainwashed Sharon Carter, but we didn't know that. All we knew was that when Civil War was over, Captain America was being taken for his trial. He was shot in the shoulder by Crossbones and everybody believed that he, the Crossbones had fired a couple more shots and it ultimately killed Captain America. In truth, Dr. Faustus had brainwashed Sharon Carter so that when Crossbones shot Captain America, it was a distraction. Everybody started looking away. They started running. They started panicking. And in the panic and the turmoil, Sharon Carter 
fired a couple shots into the stomach of Captain America and was the one that actually killed him. Now, of course, in response to this, and the reason why this is important is because following this event and Sharon Carter learning that she'd been brainwashed and she was the one that shot Cap, she began to basically listen to the voice of Dr. Faustus over and over and over again and build up a tolerance to his brainwashing techniques. The result is that while he's trying to force her to basically hail Hydra, she plays along, biding her time, waiting until the point where the superheroes strike. She grabs that as the opportunity to take out Dr. Faustus and begin operating on her side of the spectrum, trying to help bring down Hydra. And so what ends up happening here is that with this cosmic cube being incomplete, which is to say one of the shards is still missing, what ends up happening is Captain America dons a suit of armor. And with the superheroes facing off against the forces of Hydra, with them effectively winning, all hope seems to be completely lost when Hydra Captain America emerges from the Capitol building with a suit of armor powered by the Cosmic Cube, meaning he has all the powers of the cube itself. He's basically God. Man, did you guys really think I was going to make you guys wait a week? Did you really think I was going to make you wait a week for the end of Secret Empire? No, not at all. We're doing this in justice style. Hopefully you guys are excited. Anyway, so this is the conclusion. This is the end of Secret Empire. Now, the cool thing about this is that Secret Empire, at least in my opinion, is one of the coolest stories about Captain America. I mean, I get that there are some people out there who are just like, no, my opinion is an absolute. I don't like it. No one should like it because I don't like it. That's fine. I mean, I, I think it's a really cool story. But the idea here is that with, uh, with you know, the, the Hydra Captain America with Secret Empire, it's not suddenly an all new, all different Marvel thing. It is to a degree, but it's actually been one cohesive story that's been going all the way back to Castaway and Dimension Z. And that's why I like it is because it's just one great, big, huge tale of Steve Rogers as a character, which is why I say it's so cool is because we've we've read a million stories where Captain America has led the Avengers into, you know, into a conflict against a million enemies. We've seen that a million times before. Throwing a shield, fighting the bad guys, they become rinse and repeat stories. And so the idea with Secret Empire was to switch all that up, to stop doing the same rinse and repeat stories all the time, to give us like a darker character. What would happen if Captain America Steve Rogers became a bad guy? And so what this does, at least, you know, with the whole Iron Nail, Castaway and Dimension Z, that all went all the way back to the whole idea of Steve Rogers losing a super soldier serum. That's really all it was. When he lost his super soldier serum, he was basically aged up. He began to age extremely fast. And so what ended up happening is he basically handed his mantle over to Sam Wilson. Now, of course, Sam Wilson had been the sidekick for quite some time. And so it made sense that if anybody was going to be the next version of Captain America, it would be Sam Wilson because he's fought alongside him so much longer. Because of this, when all new, all different Marvel started with Steve Rogers still being an older guy, what ended up happening is there was an event that was written called Avengers Standoff. And what Avengers Standoff did is it basically brought in the idea that S.H.I.E.L.D. had basically recreated or reconstructed a cosmic cube using various shards that it existed all throughout, you know, its history and so on and so forth. And then when they reconstructed this cosmic cube, they basically created a sort of fake paradise, a more or less warped reality to essentially take over the lives of villains, which is to say, blind them from what was really going on. It was a very Matrix-esque kind of situation. The result here was that when the Avengers learned about what was going on, it was considered a violation of human rights. And so as we would expect, the Avengers responded. The Avengers basically took down uh, the entirety of Pleasant Hill, you know, the whole assault on Pleasant Hill storyline, so on and so forth. But in the midst of all this, the Red Skull had become aware of the fact that the Cosmic Cube had become sentient. But the idea here is that with S.H.I.E.L.D. being brought down, with Red Skull learning that the Cosmic Cube was sentient, Red Skull in turn used the Cosmic Cube to simply sit down and say, okay, fine, if I've never been able to beat Steve Rogers fighting him hand to hand, then I'll just alter his past and I'll just make him a Hydra agent using the Cosmic Cube. And that's exactly what happened. Now, this eventually led to a rift between Steve Rogers as a Hydra agent and Red Skull because, you know, Steve Rogers said Red Skull is not really Hydra. He's just pretending to be Hydra, ultimately killing the Red Skull, taking over Hydra himself, and then launching this campaign to take over the entirety of North America with his sights set on the world. Now, the other half of this is we picked up with something called the Vanishing Point, and we didn't really know what the Vanishing Point was. All we knew is that the classic Steve Rogers, which is to say the version that existed before Secret Empire, was just running around this Vanishing Point. Now, eventually we learned the Vanishing Point was just the mind of Cos of, of Kabik, the Cosmic Cube. It was basically this classic Steve Rogers being a memory 
of who he used to be. And so again, it, it essentially kept the concept of him alive, even if he wasn't alive in the traditional sense. Now, what this does is with that kind of catching us up to a degree, again, you know, you can go check out the most recent video to fully understand what's going on. With this basically boiling down to the entirety of the Earth superheroes taking on Hydra Captain America, they all do the best they can. But keep in mind that he's captured all but one shard of the Cosmic Cube. So even if he doesn't necessarily have the power to warp all things in existence, he's got more than enough power to take on the various superheroes. And that's exactly what he does. He basically shows up and begins taking them all down. Now, of course, this coincides with Sam Wilson handing over his shard of the Cosmic Cube, basically giving up, basically saying, hey, look, you know, here, here's your shard, do whatever it is that you wanna do. Now, in this moment, this is where all the superheroes lose. Suddenly, Captain America uses the Cosmic Cube and whisks them all away. And that's par for the course. When it comes to all these cosmic stories, whether it's the original Secret Wars, Secret Wars 2 when the Beyonder came to Earth, when it comes to the Infinity Gauntlet, Infinity War, Infinity Crusade, Infinity Abyss, when it comes to all those stories, it's always just some being with godlike power power wipes everybody from existence. So it's not new, that's routine, that always happens. It's one of the big complaints that people have when it comes to those characters, when it comes to those massive story arcs. What do you do when you're facing a foe who's virtually indestructible? Now, of course, this basically leads to this sort of recreation of Earth as Hydra Captain America wants it to be. In this instance, Doctor Doom leads the Fantastic Four instead of uh, Reed Richards. Professor Xavier and Magneto are considered mutant revolutionaries and they're executed by Hydra. But suddenly all these issues issues that, that, that Hydra Captain America sees begin to get whisked away. They begin to go away. They begin to vanish. And so with this virtual, you know, godlike power that's possessed by Hydra Captain America, with Sam Wilson again popping up on the scene saying, hey, look, here's my final shard, all these things taking place, what we end up finding out is that this was all basically a ruse by the superhero community, that they realized that it'd be almost impossible for them to directly stop Hydra Captain America. What they needed was someone who would basically be able to offer them a counterpoint. But what we end up finding out here is that with Bucky Barnes having previously been inside the vanishing point, you know, with him knowing that the memory, quote unquote, of the classic Steve Rogers is there, what he basically does is initiate this sort of rescue mission where he literally shows up inside of the vanishing point and then just tries to grab Steve Rogers, classic Steve Rogers, and bring him back. Now, the other half of this is the character of Kabik herself. The cool thing about Kabik as a character is that, again, with the cosmic cube that she comes from having been so newly created, the fact that she's a little girl is designed to mimic her stage that is to say how old she is as far as the cosmic cube is meaning the cosmic cube is like in its adolescence so to speak but with the whole character of uh, of Kabik, she's terrified of everything that's going on because remember she does not see herself as this all-powerful godly entity she sees herself as a kid who could just do some pretty crazy things and so at the end of the day she doesn't have the full wherewithal of her powers more so than that because she sees the world as someone who's just basically scared of what's going on not fully understanding or regretting her decisions, she in turn tries to run away. Now, this is why classic Captain America is so important. And this is why people loved classic Captain America. And we'll get a little more into this, you know, classic versus Hydra, you know, Steve Rogers uh, here in a minute. But with classic Steve Rogers, he was a rallying point. He was a point by which, despite the fact that you could shoot him with a gun, because that's how he died, despite the fact that you could knock him out, he was a guy that everybody implicitly trusted. He was first in, last out, always the guy to be there to make sure that things ran like they were supposed to. The result was that people would just follow him no matter where it was that he would go or what it was that he wanted to do. And this was basically the scheme that was pulled. With this cosmic cue more or less being reinstated, it's basically Hydra Captain America using the power of Kabik because she was too afraid to use it on her own. What ends up happening is that with Bucky Barnes going into the vanishing point, basically into the mind of Kabik, retrieving her alongside classic Steve Rogers, she basically takes her power back and everything starts to return to normal. And that's when we get into this battle of classic Captain America versus Hydra Captain America. And that's the cool thing here. These characters are able to exist simultaneously because one's a memory and one is not. If we had to sit down and we had to say, okay, if we're basing this you know, on like the physical form, right? Like the physical body, which one's the real Captain America? Then it's Hydra Cap. This is the same Captain America we've been seeing for years and years and years, just with his, uh, with his history altered. The classic Captain America that you're seeing right now with the blue outfit and the A on his head and all that kind of stuff, he's basically a memory 
given physical form. And so it's essentially a resurrection of sorts. Now, of course, with this fight between the two of them, it is the quintessential battle of like freedom versus security. That's really what this is designed to represent because the whole story was basically predicated on that. It was the story that created this kind of argument that really hailed to that, that phrase that's overused. You know, those who would sacrifice freedom for security, blah, 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 blah. You know, it's that whole argument come to bear in this story because the nature of this is that these guys both represent two separate sides, both of which are valid. If you guys are familiar, myself, Zodical Candy, and a comic historian run a channel called Eligible Monster where we talk about games and do all kinds of cool stuff. Stuff. One of the discussions that we had recently was we ran over who was right in injustice. Was it was it Superman? Was it Batman? You know, Superman basically wanted to rule the world through control, but he basically became a dictator. Batman was the guy who was fighting against him as the rebel. In this story, it's much the same way. Hydra Steve Rogers wants to rule the world with absolute control. Classic Steve Rogers says, no, people need to choose. But notice this, both sides are legitimate. Say for example, that there you're walking down an alley and there's a little girl you know, and her parents have just been killed by a mugger. You don't catch the mugger, the mugger runs off, the little girl's crying. Are you really gonna walk up to her and say, look, I know we probably could have prevented this from happening, but you losing your parents is the price you pay for freedom because the alternative is that we try to stop crime everywhere and we restrict people's rights and things like that. Are you gonna be the one to tell that little girl that? Well, of course not, but at the same time, freedom is a necessity. And that's why both these things are so important is because there's a balancing act. You can't have one in the extreme. You can't have extreme freedom. You can't have you can't have a society where it's just hey do whatever you want to and whatever happens happens. But you also can't have a society where you say nobody can do anything without my permission first because at that point things go absolutely awry. You have to have this middle ground. People can do things, but there have to be consequences for it. Law and order has to exist. Checks and balances have to exist. People can commit crimes, but there have to be punishment for those crimes. You know, there's imperfections all throughout the system as it exists, but you try to make it work as best you can. And ultimately, that's the argument class Captain America has and that's why people love him so much is because at the end of the day he says look things are screwed up things aren't necessarily right but in the end the freedom that we enjoy gives us the freedom to choose it gives us the freedom to say what if we don't like the direction that things are going in what if we don't like where we are right now then let's change it because if you walk up to a person and you say change your life and you put a gun in their face they'll change their life until that gun goes away and then once the gun's gone they'll go right back to where they were before. True change has to happen organically. People have to change because it's fear of where they used to be versus where they could be that drives them to keep doing better. And that's the goal of classic Captain America. He says, look, we've made all kinds of mistakes, war, disease, famine, we've done all kinds of terrible things, but we can learn from them. We can look at where we used to be and say, why would we wanna go back to that? Let's go to this. Let's look to the brighter future and let's do that instead. Hydra Captain America had a similar view. His idea was to do it at the barrel of a gun. Now, at the end of the day, it also raises the question, if the ultimate goal is achieved, then of what difference is there? And if these people cared about their freedom so much, then why weren't they fighting for it? And so that, that really brings that, that whole thing into play. It brings that whole question in. Well, you know, you can't stick your head in the sand, hoping things will get better and then complain when they don't. Doing things changes things, doing nothing Thing keeps things exactly as they are. And so because of that, in this moment, when we basically have this question of who's the correct person here, Hydra Captain America does the only thing that he can do, grabs the hammer of Thor in an attempt to lift it up and prove his worth, only to find out that he can't, that he's not worthy, because he no longer believes he is. He's no longer righteous. He's no longer the right guy here. Now, of course, this leads to classic Captain America picking up the hammer of Thor. Now, this is not the first time we've seen this, but it's always one of those cool things. And that's why people say, well, the fact that he's picked it up so often is the fact that so many people have lifted the hammer of Thor it doesn't really even matter anymore that's nonsense that's that's absolute that's absolute tomfoolery it is the context of when the hammer's picked up that makes it matter in 50 years we could have stories where a thousand people lifted the hammer of Thor but the context in which the hammer is picked up is what makes it important because this provides a kind of finality it provides an answer to that question no classic Captain America's right no Hydra Captain America's wrong that's the end of that. There's no discussion. There's no debate. None of that stuff. This is how it is. And that's what makes it so cool is because it's almost like this, this sort of, you know, mic drop, right? Just like, boom, I hit you with the hammer of Thor. Mic drop. Like, 
it's one of those really, really cool moments. It's one of those cool things. But what ends up happening here is things wrap up relatively fast. I mean, it basically turns into a rebuilding phase. But one thing to keep in mind is that despite the fact that things have changed, one thing that, that classic Captain America did not have Kabik do is wipe the minds of the whole of humanity. It's important that the whole of humanity remember. They'll look at superheroes with a skewed perspective. They'll look at superheroes and they won't necessarily trust them again. But at the end of the day, they will know that the superheroes did right by them. The superheroes didn't change anything, trying to make things better again. Okay, so we are getting into the aftermath of Secret Empire. And God, man, I'm going into the weekend. I'm loafing this weekend. <laughs> I am I am not really going to do anything if it doesn't require me to. Uh, I'm going to watch Netflix. I'm going to clean up my house. I'm going to have a good weekend. I don't know, maybe like cook some really nice dinners or something like that. But Secret Empire admittedly has been one of the most divisive stories that I've ever read in the history of comics. I mean, I was there when like the clone saga with Spider-Man, I was there when that whole thing happened. And like, it was interesting to see, but it was really more of like fans of Spider-Man. It wasn't like a split in the Marvel community. And it's been nuts to watch this whole thing unfold. But whenever we would do character explanations and we would talk about stories that would split the Marvel community, you guys are living through this in real time. Now, people are more vocal now than they've ever been because they have Twitter and Facebook and YouTube channels like mine and so on and so forth. But the idea here is that this story just really created a rift in the community <laughs> and it was crazy. But if you've, if you've not had a chance to see my Secret Empire videos, I highly recommend that you go check them out just for the sake of understanding everything that's going on. But the idea, S.H.I.E.L.D. had created a Cosmic Cube, the Cosmic cube had become sentient and the result was that the cosmic cube was taken over by the red skull and it was taught to believe in hydra's ideologies in response to this at the request of the red skull the cosmic cube altered the the reality of captain america steve rogers it altered its past to in order to make it out that steve rogers was a hydra agent and so with this altered reality what steve rogers began to do was go through and basically implement his plan to allow hydra to take over the united states setting its sights on the world and then using the cosmic cube to take over the the entire universe. Now, of course, this led to this hunt for the cosmic cube in the sense that the cube had basically been shattered and it was literally just this chase to find all these different shards. But what Marvel also gave us was an out. They gave us something called the vanishing point. And what we ended up learning was that with the cosmic cube becoming sentient, it also became terrified of what the world was like with Hydra ruling it. And so what the cosmic cube did is it created the vanishing point as a place where the memory of these various superheroes, specifically Captain America, with how he used to be, was basically held. And so what ended up happening is that at the end of Secret Empire, this memory was given a physical body. And this basically was the return of classic Captain America. And so classic Captain America fought against Hydra Captain America and the classic version one. And so in the aftermath of this, this story picks up with essentially what amounts to a healing process, the idea that the world is rebuilding. But the coolest thing about this is that this focuses on the question, who was right in Secret Empire? And how did things transpire? Did they transpire the way that we think they did? Or are we not remembering it correctly? Directly. And that's the crazy thing, because there is this prison that was created within the realm of the of the Marvel Universe, at least this prison, as it's called the Shadow Pillar. Now, Shadow Pillar basically seems to be the Florence, Colorado Supermax. Now, for those of you guys who don't know, here in the real world, Florence, Colorado is home to a Supermax prison where people spend 23 hours out of the day in solitary confinement. They get one hour to basically go out and, and do their own thing, but it's housed the most violent individuals in the world, like Timothy McVeigh, for example, after blowing the federal building in half in Oklahoma City. He was housed in Florence, Colorado until he was executed. So again, there's all these different things, you know, with regards to the comparisons between Marvel and the real world, but there's only one occupant of the Shadow Pillar prison, and that's Hydra Captain America. Now, of course, the classic version goes to see him, and this is probably one of the greatest conversations in the history of Marvel Comics. It's so cool the way this unfolds, because it's the question, who was really right here? Now, the funny thing is that when this conversation initially opens, it's really just Hydra Cap saying, I know why you're here. Like, you're here for maybe some kind of indication you're here to basically say hey look you know yeah man i was right you were wrong but the funny thing about this is that hydra cap makes the point in basically saying i didn't break any laws i didn't do anything illegal and that's the funny thing about this is because remember when he rose to power it's not like he walked into the united states with an army of hydra agents assassinated the president wiped out congress destroyed the Supreme court it wasn't the handmaid's tale and the rise of the sons of jacob it was him coming in and actually being given that power and with that absolute authority 
he conquered the United States. He was asked to be director of S.H.I.E.L.D. He was given the position, given that power by an external source. He never actually conquered anyone. He never actually killed anyone in terms of, you know, his role or his, his rise to power. And that's what makes this so cool is because in the face of this, classic Captain America says, well, we'll end up finding you accountable anyway. And Hydra Captain America's response is, yeah because I'm not a friend. And this is really cool because myself and Comic Story and we're talking about this and he's starting a secret a secret empire coverage and you guys should definitely check it out. But we were running we were running over this whole thing. And that's the crazy thing about it is because Hydra Captain America is not wrong. If we look at the various characters who have gone through and who have engaged in actions that have resulted in the loss of life, you have characters like Magneto who stood trial for his actions, but Magneto's not an Avenger. The Scarlet Witch, Quicksilver, they were both Avengers. They've done some pretty heinous things and they were never held accountable. Captain America America is one of these guys who protects his own. And that's the reason why this is such a great big huge debate is because the whole argument, the whole point that Hydra Captain America makes here is you're a guy who protects the people that you agree with. You protect the people that you like. You don't protect the people that you don't like. Not only that, it's also this equation being dragged in of what's the world like now? Is the world really a better place? Because in this instance, what Hydra Captain America says is, look, I was literally trying to make the world better. I saw this perfect world where there was no war. I saw this perfect world where there was no panic. There was no chaos. There was no famine. There were no, no children starving in the streets. There were no people robbing banks in order to make sure they could provide their own. That none of that stuff was there. I saw a perfect world. And then you came along and you took it. You took it away. And you basically returned the world back to the way that it used to be. And what he ends up saying is, you may believe that you've won, but you haven't won because Hydra had this perfect world. For a brief moment in time, those who were loyal to Hydra saw this perfect reality. And the result is that when you took it away, they are now all the more desperate. It's tantamount to going to a starving man, giving him a sandwich, letting him have one bite, and then taking the sandwich away. He'll do almost anything to get it back in order to satiate that hunger that's aching him so bad. And so the ultimate argument here is that Hydra is going to be more desperate now than they've ever been because they want that world that they saw for a brief glimpse in time. Now, what this also does is it transitions for a second to characters like the Punisher. And it's kind of cool here because with the Punisher, because of the fact that he basically says, look, I followed Hydra Captain America because he was Captain America. Then once it was revealed that Hydra Captain America was basically a bad guy, that Punisher basically sort of turncoated, ended up going back to his normal way and just killing everybody who was Hydra. But that's the funny thing about this is because until classic Captain America showed up, there was no reason for Punisher to believe that Hydra Captain America and classic Captain Captain America were two different people. Now remember, this is not new. In the original Civil War story, one of the things that Marvel solidified is that Frank Castle fought in the Vietnam War because he wanted to be like Captain America. Frank Castle idolizes Captain America. And so because of that, whatever Captain America does, Frank Castle will go along with it. And so again, it's really a funny situation because one of the things that I noticed with regards to the comments on Secret Empire is a lot of people were like, no way Punisher would join Hydra Captain America. But he would because the actions of Hydra Captain America fall perfectly in line with what Frank Castle does. Frank Castle doesn't go around to like food banks and like donate money. He just goes around and kills criminals wherever he finds them. So he really is in a lot of ways exactly what it was that Hydra was fighting for at the time. The other half of this is the question of did classic Steve Rogers make the world better by setting things the way they used to be? Under the rule of Hydra, sure, superheroes were killed and sure, inhumans were basically tossed in camps, but people were not afraid of their neighbors. People could leave their doors unlocked at night because they knew that everybody was too scared to break into their homes. Nobody committed any crimes whatsoever because the hammer of Hydra came down fast and it came down swift. And so because of this, with classic Steve Rogers setting things back to the way they used to be, now people go back to being scared again. People go back to being fearful of their neighbors where people didn't have poverty, where we didn't have homelessness because Hydra provided everybody with everything they needed. Well, then suddenly people are cast back down into homelessness. People are cast back down into poverty. Governmental corruption will run rampant once again. Money will be the defining factor on what it is that makes a person worthwhile. The world is not better than it was. But notice this. This is the exact same argument that we had when it came to injustice. The question is, is it worth giving up everything? Is it worth people basically living in fear of their government in place of living in fear of their neighbor? Is that a sacrifice that people are willing to make? And those are the opposing dichotomies of these two guys as they 
they argue, as they debate, that's what they're talking about. The question is, who came out on top here? Is the world a better place because of the fact that it's the way that it used to be? In this instance, Hydra Captain America basically says, at least I was honest about what I was. At least I came forward and said, I am an agent of Hydra. At least I came forward and I launched the entire campaign and I told people, if you commit crimes, you will be dealt with harshly. I was the government operating in order to ensure a safer and secure America. With classic Captain America and with the Avengers, it's not that way. Remember, that was the whole basis behind the champions. The champions joined up. They, they formed their own group because they were tired of seeing the Avengers go into local towns, go into communities, fight these villains, and then just walk off and say, okay, everything's cool now. When people were watching their livelihoods come crashing down, when they were watching the homes they built destroyed because the Avengers were going through and fighting villains, and then the Avengers just leave, the people looked to Hydra as an alternative. The people welcomed Hydra because in the face of the Hydra rule, sure, it was dark, it was dystopian, but it also kept them safe and secure. They didn't have to worry about their homes being destroyed because the Avengers were fighting some villain. And when the fight was finished, the Avengers just left. And at the same time, no one appointed Captain America as a protector of the country. It's not like the Avengers are a government sanctioned superhero team. The Avengers just formed one day. People basically, you know, lauded them and said, yeah, sure. Like we love them being here. We love, you know, we love them protecting us. But the argument of Hydra Captain America is what's the difference between what you did and what I did? Because people celebrated me too. People said, yeah, Hydra's keeping us protected. The the actions of the Avengers, the X-Men, the maximum security storyline, the Onslaught saga, all this has basically been these massive calamities because superheroes chose that they were going to be the protectors. And in the aftermath of these conflicts, they dusted their hands. They said, yes, the good guy's winning. They patted themselves on the back. They went to the bar. They had a beer and they thought nothing of the people who were being affected. That was never their concern. You didn't see the Avengers rebuilding people's homes. You didn't see the Avengers funding individual people who lost their livelihood because the business they worked out was destroyed during a conflict. You didn't see that. And so in this instance, Hydra Captain America says, we're basically the same thing. You're vigilantes. You appointed yourselves as protectors. You do whatever you feel you need to do in order to keep the country protected. You protect your own. You protect Avengers because they're your friends. I do the exact same thing. So what's the difference? Now, the other side of this argument is classic Captain America comes along and says, because you imprison innocent people, because you took people who you deemed to be the enemy and you threw them in jail because you didn't like what they did. You went through back alley deals. You lied. You were duplicitous. You tricked people and you used my face to do it. And that's the huge crux of this argument. When S.H.I.E.L.D. gave Hydra Captain America absolute power, they didn't know they were giving it to a Hydra agent. Otherwise, they never would have. They thought they were giving it to classic Captain America, who had fought alongside the United States for years and years and years and years. That's the difference here is that, yes, Hydra Captain America made the country safer. But at the end of the day, he was sacrificing all the wrong things to do it. The argument that classic classic Captain America makes here is the same argument that I made well after I was done playing devil's advocate about Batman. <laughs> But it was the argument that I made towards the tail end of the video, which you can find over at Comic Story and on the RNBE podcast, when we were arguing injustice. Sure, the world is imperfect. Sure, there are terrible things that happen to good people, and there are good things that happen to bad people. The difference between some totalitarian fascist regime imposing its own will and its own order, and people who were allowed to explore their own order and their own will means that people under the role of freedom are allowed to get better. They're allowed to look at the way things used to be and say, we we don't want to be there anymore. We don't want to cross that bridge anymore. We don't want to be in a world where we're afraid of our neighbors. We don't want to be in a world where we have to rob in order to feed ourselves or our children. We want to live in a world where we don't have to worry about those kinds of things. And so because of that, it's Hydra Captain America saying, yes, you instilled order, but it only would have lasted for so long. You're not going to live forever. And even if you were an enlightened dictatorship, even if you were benign in terms of how you dealt with the average person, who's to say the next person who took over your role would be the same. And so the idea idea here is that in a free society, people have the ability to better their own lives. That's the importance of it. People have the ability to evolve, to grow, to eventually move beyond individual desires and wants and think about what's best for the society. And that's the argument that classic Captain America makes. And so again, we're not really given a resolution on who's right or who's wrong. We're just kind of told these are the arguments that are out there. And so what ends up happening is ultimately with the guards showing up and with classic Captain America leaving, we end up finding out that Hydra Captain America right, was right when he said Hydra everywhere. Hydra will never go away because we end up finding out that one of these prison guards is a Hydra agent when he says, hail Hydra, indicating that at some point along
along the line, Hydra Captain America will probably be let loose. But with that being said, guys, we're going to go ahead and bring this video to an end. If you are new here to Comments Explain, make sure you guys hit the sub button to become part of the Rob Corps. If you guys enjoyed this video, make sure you drop a like. And yeah, <laughs> I will catch you all later. Peace.